Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Game Face, episode 380 on Sifted Games at Sifted.net. I'm Shane Satterfield, your host for the next couple hours of awesome video game discussion, and as always, alongside me to do that is Matthew Kyle. Matt posted the links to your shorts mm -hmm. in the YouTube version. People thanked us for it. Did you, did you get a little boost in views for them? A little bit. The, the director's been sending comments. He's like, one of yours. One of cool. Yours. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> awesome. They mentioned it. Yeah. yeah. So if you guys are looking for that, by the way, um, if you're well, if you watch the show on YouTube, our last episode, if you look in the description, there's links to both of Matt's most recent shorts in there. Give them a watch, rate them, share it, all that kind of stuff. Anything you can do to help our boy Matt would be greatly appreciated. So, And in fact, you know what? I'll post the links for that in this episode as well. So if you're watching this episode on YouTube, look down in the description. I'll put the links down there so you guys can check it out. Definitely worth watching. How long are both of them? Uh, both about 10 minutes. 10 minutes, yeah. So, again, they're shorts. They don't take that long to watch. Support our boy Matt if you can. Um, how's your week been, Matt? All right. Yeah? Um, yeah. No, I mean, Oscars weekend. Yeah? What what do you think about the Oscars in five minutes? Pretty solid. I mean, it's a, it's a, it felt more like a celebration of movies for once. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think they do have a, a good host in Kimmel. Um, uh, a couple of the shot, shots near the beginning... Um, uh, because Kimmel was involved, and our cinematographer for those shorts is uh, also does stuff for that show. Um, the uh, couple of the shots in the Oscars were shot by him, by the same camera oh. that shot. Oh wow! Our, our, uh, That's our awesome. Stuff. So he's uh, doing his stuff over there for Kimmel, um, which uh -huh. is cool. And uh, yeah, I was pretty happy. I mean, I knew Oppenheimer was. It just wiped win the mat with everything. all the other films. But I'm glad that Poor Things did well. They did, you know, all the production design and costume and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Emma Stone winning was a surprise, but I think she totally deserved it. She is that entire movie. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably my pick for my favorite movie of the year. I still haven't seen Oppenheimer. It's Does good. it deserve it? In comparison, like against that competition, no. I would put, um, I would put uh, Barbie. Uh, poor things, uh, zone of interest, and probably Anatomy of a Fall above Oppenheimer. Um, but it's also sort of a body of work award. It was sort of time to give Christopher Nolan his Oscar. Did uh, Barbie win anything? Barbie won Best Song. That's it. That's it. That's it. Are you surprised by that? No. No. That was that was my bet. Um, I only got seventeen of twenty three right this year. That's but, pretty good. But that was uh, <laughs> I think usually that's really I, good. usually I do better than that. Um, I didn't win the pool. Um, I used to win the Oscar pool every time I went to any Oscar party, but then I started going to Oscar parties with filmmakers, and yeah. like that's a much tougher. Now it becomes who who guessed the short correctly, basically. Yeah. Um, and I got the sh uh, two of the two of the shorts wrong. Um, uh, I got um, best actress wrong because I thought it was going to be Lily, Lily Gladstone. Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of a coin flip. They. Both I think a lot of people were surprised by that. Though. Yeah, but well, they both won a bunch of stuff. But Lily won the the um, Golden Globe, so I thought that was going to be her. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I have no problem with Emma winning it because Emma was phenomenal in that movie. Like it's hard to believe that's the same character at the end of the film. It's really good performance. What about um, uh, Robert Downey Jr.? Did he deserve his award? Do you think? Um, again, or was I, it one of those things where it's like you know what? We haven't given one to yeah. him yet, so I, he's I think, close here. And I think it's one of the. I think it's like body of work a little mm -hmm. bit, and this is a good time to do it for him. Um, his speech was a lot of fun, uh, but personally, I would probably have given it to Sterling K. Brown, who was really the heart of American fiction mm -hmm. in a big way. Um, actually, I also like I also liked American fiction more than Oppenheimer. Now that I think about it. Oh. Um, and uh, and you know like Mark Ruffalo really Mark Ruffalo really like knocked it out of the park and poor he's things. a great actor uh, he is but poor things is one of his best I haven't watched that yet either and um, he, I I would have been perfectly happy with him winning supporting actor as well yeah um, he was really really good and it was and doubly good because like apparently he was really not sure he could pull that role off and and was talked into it by the director and he just nails it mm -hmm. just absolutely nails it um, yeah. Uh, good I watched stuff parts overall. of it. One thing I did notice is I I managed to just jump in at one point where I don't know if it was like lead actress or supporting actress, but they were about to present the award and they showed the stage and they have like these banners hanging down. Yeah. That was all the different actors, uh, previous winners introducing each nominee. Yeah. And then like they raise the things and the women mm -hmm. are behind it and it's really cool production wise. As somebody who's worked on a bunch of award shows, I was like, that's pretty freaking cool. But it also seemed very narcissistic. 
it's a little I mean it's it's nice that everybody gets gets the little moment mm-hmm. there and it's cool especially cool when like the people introducing the the, the nominee is a friend of yeah. the nominee like I would like to see them remove the requirement that they were previous winners oh, yeah. and just bring in people who know, know them, them yeah. like cuz it's a nice moment yeah yeah the other thing is like you, it's kind of gross to only do that for just the actors yeah you know where's oh, the, yeah. where's the cinematographer well, I mean, yeah. I feel that, you know, it, yeah, anyone you know who's I mean? ever worked in production, I think you watch the Oscars and you think to yourself, like, man, it's like we don't exist. Yeah, where, you know? like, where's the, like, where's the, <laughs> the, 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 there's no shortage of adoration, adulation and adoration for the actors. Like, the yeah. last categories you needed to make longer and more indulgent were the acting categories. Yeah, yeah. It's like, where's the best stunts category? I mean, like, I understand And next that. year they're adding best casting, which I don't even oh, really? know how to gauge that. I'm like, I'm not going to even know how to put that down. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's, it's a little, like, I like it, cons- like, it's kind of, the execution is cool, I just, it's like, okay, so you're gonna take up that much more of it with, like, you know... Narcissism, narciss- basically. Yeah, I yeah. mean, and it's not super narcissism, because it's, like, other people saying nice things about the I mean, people, let's be it's honest, like, it's, that's what entertainment is. Like, if you work in production, mm-hmm. this is something that you deal with if you work behind the scenes, like, you bust your ass, and then the talent comes in, they do their thing mm-hmm. for an hour or two, and then they leave... You've worked on this stuff for yeah. 20 hours or whatever. No one ever knows that you did all that. They yeah. just know the person. But that's, it's a deal that you make when you enter production that that's the way it is. I mean, you need do, to learn how to deal with it. I mean, they do bring, they did bring all this, the crew out at the beginning and, sh- you know, gave them all their big round of applause. Mm-hmm. I mean, in part because they don't want, they don't want them to necessarily strike next year. Um, <laughs> you right. but, um, I mean, the other thing is, like, nobody wants to see an award for best grip. Like, people no, just don't care. But they want to see the celebrities. But that's where sound, and I mean, yeah. again, and the thing is, like, yeah, it's I like the, the, little, the little introductions for everybody, but it's like, I'd like to some, see some introductions for, like, sound, mm-hmm. or other, you know, because, like, I don't know anything. I mean, I yeah, know yeah. who Emma Stone is. I don't yeah. know who this, necessarily who the cinematographer of yeah. this guy is, that whatever. Um, you know, that, that would be more interesting to me to some degree. Um, happy that Godzilla won the yeah. FX. Um, it got some love. First, first Oscar for Godzilla. Hearing the Godzilla theme, <laughs> and the, it might be the last. <laughs> hearing the Godzilla theme for the, from the Oscar orchestra was certainly That's something cool. I didn't expect. Yeah. Uh, and then the other one I was really I was wrong about was I thought Oppenheimer would win sound because usually the winner of sound and editing usually the editing and sound winners you can pick because they are the ones with the most sound and editing. Yeah. You know, <laughs> not necessarily the best, but just the most. Yeah, yeah. And, and I hear you. Nolan's movies certainly have. The most sound. Yes, <laughs> and uh, however, that. Zone of Interest won, and that's correct because Zone of Interest is some of the best storytelling through sound I I saw all year. I'll have to check it's that out. Remarkable. Too. Um, be ready. Okay. It's a. It's a. It's a I have the surround sound system to do it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it tells a story through this. It's incredible. Wow. Um, so cool. They, so I'm excited I, to for check once, it out. For once, they then. picked the right thing. You know, I, right. I was like, oh wow. I mean, th- that's categories voted on by people who do actually sound, do it. So it's <laughs> a little different. Yeah. But like, yeah. No, I was pretty happy with it overall um let's see what our crew is saying about the oscars if they even watched people just don't watch award shows anymore I th- actually they, the ratings for this were up for the fourth year in a row wow and very well that's amazing another barbenheimer bump i think wow um oh jow zimpit <laughs> i think that's how you say it thank you for twitch prime man that's awesome we appreciate it uh rafael michael thank you for twitch prime Little fact that you guys may not know, Raphael Michael did a lot of the designs for our t-shirts. Not the one that Matt's wearing, mm-hmm. but the ones with more of the stylized kind of graffiti art. Raphael Michael did all those. He's a great artist. Um, Toast9, thank you for Twitch Prime. Don Lionheart, thank you. Gizmo Gladstone, thank you. Who else? Wonkler13, Life Ends. That's a pretty good username, Life Ends. Um, and Antacid Hayes. <laughs> Obviously around our age, Matt, would be mm-hmm. my guess. Um... Let's see what you guys are saying about the Oscars, if you have any. That Ryan Gosling performance, does that yeah. mean good or bad? Good. It was good? I, I'm just Ken. It's probably, it was one of the best live Oscar song performances of all time. Wow. That's from Barry Gooster. Um, Andy T. Monaghan, Godzilla, and Miyazaki Boy, and the Harem was nice to see. Mm-hmm. Um, Barry Lomax says that Mark Ruffalo is from Wisconsin, where he's also from. Um, a lot of people say they need to see Poor Things. Or uh, things is great. Don't watch it with your kids or your parents. Don't watch it with them. No. Oh, interesting. Lots of sex. Yeah. Oh, okay. That is very awkward. <laughs> There's nothing worse that you're watching like back when you're like a teenager or whatever. Mm-hmm. You're watching a movie with your parents and a sex scene comes on. It has to be one of the most awkward moments. Yeah. I mean, the me. movie is about her 
like sex life sex yeah but it's like it's weird it's like a tim burton movie it's, it's oh. imagine if tim burton had actually matured as a director oh. <laughs> over time that's sort of what this is okay it takes place in a weird sort of like steampunky diesel punky world and yeah um aj the legend says he loved the oscars a good one very gooser says it got the barbenheimer bump meaning yeah. a lot of people watch for barbie and Oppenheimer. It, it, people will watch if you have the movies that are nominated are things people care about i think barbenheimer got a big bump for it i think um godzilla helped with another sliver of the audience like a lot of stuff going on there uh and then it's a couple more uh mellow pintor says emma earned that oscar yep uh, link so good says did. when is godzilla minus one coming to streaming do you know they don't know yet um, you're still, it wasn't really planned to get a release here, oh. really. You know, because it was but now it's a, it's a Godzilla movie. It was, yeah, supposed yeah. To, it was supposed to run for a week, <laughs> right, you know, yeah. ran for two months. Um, they're negotiating with Janus Films about a, a 4K release, which means it will probably come out through the Criterion Collection. Okay, um, which is also what the Showa era box set came out through them. So they they seem to handle Godzilla movies in the U.S. now, which is also very funny because you know Criterion is. Yeah. High end, you know, yeah. film, 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 film yeah, stuff. Film. But uh, <laughs> the thousandth Criterion release was a box set collection of all the Showa era Godzilla movies, which is pretty great. That is great. Um, I hardly ever go to the movies anymore. I wait to watch stuff on streaming. So I saw that um, Poor Things is on Hulu right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have Hulu. It's like one of the only services I don't have, though. Um, but it's already out on streaming, which is a good sign, which means it'll be coming probably to yeah, other services. On- Everything, yeah, all the best picture nominees are on streaming. Although I think Zone of Interest you can only buy on Amazon for nineteen ninety nine. I don't think you can rent it yet. Okay. Um, which I did buy it to see it because I hadn't seen it in a theater. Uh, weird movie to own. Don't think I'll go back and rewatch that one a lot. It's a, it's a heavy. It's a heavy heavy trip. But. Yeah. Uh, Retro Modern Gamer says Oppenheimer was the only new movie I saw last year. I don't think I saw a single movie in theaters last year. I saw dozens. Really? Dozens of dozens. I mean, I, I see movies in theaters whenever I can. Are um, people showing up to theaters? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're doing oh, good. Yeah, like it's, it's especially around here. I mean, the only, we, we go, like, our movie night group goes usually Thursday night or Friday night opening stuff and, like, mm-hmm. at the Chinese theater sometimes. And, like, that's always full, of, you know, not the edges, but, like, mm-hmm. once, you know. Yeah, I think the what was the only, I mean, I didn't see Madam Webb. So, I, I, as I understand, the theater, nobody did, apparently. For that. <laughs> um, but the only, um, God, what was uh, there was something that didn't do well last year that was like the this I haven't seen the theater that oh it was um, the a superhero movie yeah it was the Flash yeah the Flash was emptier than I'd seen anything since the Uncharted movie whoa um, it was like, no <laughs> and it's already out there I think yeah. it's on Amazon Prime now for streaming oh I mean that was half a year ago yeah it was, it, it, they. As soon as six weeks is up, you're usually seeing there it on, is. on streaming. I mean, which I'm way. totally cool with. Like, Madam Web will probably be on streaming March 19th. That's exactly <laughs> when that theatrical run is over. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, this is a video game podcast, believe it or not. This is Game Phase 380. Um, miraculously, we have a huge episode today. I know at the end of last week's episode, we were kind of looking ahead and we were like, hmm, what are we going to do with next week's show? As it turns out, plenty of content for an episode of Game Face. In fact, we can't really spend a lot of time just messing around. We have a lot to get to in this week's show. Um, Let's just kick it off. Let's get it going. Let's start with our housekeeping. And there's a lot of that as well this week. A lot of smaller stories that were hitting the industry over the last seven days. The first one that I should bring up is unrelated to the industry in general, but we are taking questions for Pactor Factor right now. Um, If you are a patron, there's a pl- there's an article up on our Patreon right now where you can leave a comment. If you use sifted.net, there's a post there where you can go and leave comments. And if you're just a user who watches us on YouTube or listens to our show on any of the podcast services, if you go to youtube.com slash siftedgames and click the community tab, right there is a blog post where you can reply to it with your questions as well. Uh, we shoot the shows on Friday of this week, so I have a crazy week again. Uh, so you have a couple days to get your questions in. There's a lot going on. Don't forget about all the layoffs that just happened. The PlayStation layoffs, the EA layoffs. There's tons of fodder for Pactor Factor questions, so get those in. Uh, the first real story for this week's housekeeping, though, is Mario Day 2024. This is turning into a thing, Matt. Like, it feels like the last two years Nintendo's made a big deal about Mario Day. And I guess the the I is a one or something? In Mario Day? Yeah, March 10th. For March 10th, M-A-R-10, basically, yeah. day. Um, why is March 10th Mario Day? Because that makes Mario. 
Oh, that's the only reason? Yeah. It has no consequence Archive. with the actual video game franchise or no. anything? <laughs> that's same hilarious. reason. Same reason May 4th is Star Wars Day. Yeah, I guess you're right. Same reason November 7th is N7 Day for yeah. Mass Effect. Yeah, that's true, I guess. Um, and it is becoming a big thing, and therefore Nintendo is kind of holding big announcements for this thing. Um, it announced release dates for two of its big upcoming games, uh, Paper Mario, The Thousand Year Door. I don't still can't figure out if this is a remake or a remaster for Switch. That's a remake. Yeah. It, there's a I lot mean, of work. It looks like they, I mean, I didn't look like they changed the content, but I think they definitely built all new assets for this. That yeah. That's not the GameCube version. Definitely not. They've up, at the very least, they've done a lot of work on the assets for it to up them. Uh, that is coming out on uh, May 23rd. So not much longer to wait for that. Again, Matt and I have said this before. This is probably the best Paper Mario game ever oh, I made. Don't, I don't... I, think you would have very few people who oh the first one i guess a lot of people say some but this is i mean this is a refinement of it and like i mean i, I think this is definitely where they nailed the formula and then did that nintendo thing where like well we you can't just repeat ourselves you can repeat yourself if it's this good <laughs> like, you can just do this again with a different story and some different abilities and call it a fucking day for a long time this was one of the most valuable gamecube games if yeah. you had it yeah it complete a hundred yeah like um, in ter- certainly in terms of the the like the mass produced stuff like mm-hmm. say, you know, stuff like Cubivore, sure it was yeah. like in terms of like stuff you could have found at, at any Best Buy for like two years straight. Yeah, all of a sudden this was worth a ton of money. Yeah, but now my guess is the value of those GameCube games are probably going to drop a good bit. No, they won't. No, they you won't. don't think people, so. People want the originals. They want the actual physical copy. That they want the GameCube version. Yeah, I mean you're always going to find people who are trying to collect every GameCube game. Yeah, but every like that's most collectors now. It is the up. Retro, yeah. The retro scene is ridiculous at this point. Like. The prices are insane. The, is it the, better for me to sell stuff now, Matt? Or is it better for me to wait another 15 years and sell the stuff? Who knows? Because you're right. Like, right now, the iron's hot. Should I strike? Probably. I mean, the people with nostalgia for this era aren't going to last forever. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. Like, because back, you know, 15 years from now, people are going to be doing this with the, the Wii U. Well, if you watch, you know, a lot of the collectors... Finally, that Devil's Third copy is going to pay off. <laughs> Seriously, if you watch a lot of like the collector videos on YouTube, you're right. A lot of those people are like 60. Yeah. It's a 20. It's a 20 year like lag basically, and like the the real retro. You're talking about like, Genesis re- stuff. Like yeah, those guys are older than us. Yeah, uh, the people that are kind of hosting. The, except, um, and this is the one I I recommend uh, in terms of the YouTube stuff for retro is it's called Now in the Nineties, mm-hmm. and they do this week. They put a video out every week, and it's what came out this week thirty years ago. Oh, this like this week cool. thirty years ago. I thought about doing a feature like that on Sifted. Mm-hmm. And like it's very a good. daily they, thing. They dig up old commercials and they cover all this. It's like the, the host does like the main stuff and then like this VO guy who's supposed to, supposedly the editor, yeah. he has to do all the roundup, like the, the VO roundup of all the sports games. Oh, okay. Out. And it's just, sometimes it just <laughs> never ends. It's just like, God, there was a lot of sports games that came out. You know what I finally just did, Matt? I took all the sports games out of my collection and I just threw them away. Yeah. I had worth nothing. like 30 some Xbox 360 sports games. I literally just threw in the trash. Yeah, because they're not worth anything. Yeah, they're anything, worth like fifty anything cents. Anything that's not NCAA college basketball is worth nothing. Or college football. Yeah. But even now, the new college football is coming out here in a few months, and the value of that will be zero. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. I remember I went back to the the game store I used to work at in ninety eight, ninety nine. I went back there a couple to last one of my last few visits. Just look around, and they still they still exist. There's just the independent you know, own. Yeah. Uh, it's a sub. It's like a annex of a record store that's been there for as long as I can remember. Uh-huh. And they still have. Uh, work, the guy working behind the counter was the grandchild of the owner who like used to hang out in my in, in the store when I worked there and watch Dragon Ball Z against my yeah. will. Um, <laughs> but uh, they still had this little stack of Madden 64 that was I guarantee were the same <laughs> the cartridges same that one. were there Absolutely. when I was there. There's no doubt about that. Nobody wants Madden 64. It was bad when it came out. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was this gimped version of Madden that was just awful. So, yeah, I, I, I can't imagine anybody would ever want one of those. Yeah. Like, unless they're you could, completing You could probably a trick someone young enough into thinking it's Madden 1964. <laughs> but, but that's before the NFL even existed. That was 68, I think. They don't they, know that. Well, actually, the NFL did exist. The AFL and the NFL came together to form mm-hmm. the NFL. So, yeah, I guess it did exist. Kids are dumb. You they can, are. You can, you can <laughs> they don't know their history, anything. Matt. Um, some more stuff from... Mario Day is we also got the release date for Luigi's Mansion 2 HD, which is really Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon, which was a handheld game. Um, but they've obviously this is definitely a remake because you know they had to yeah. completely rebuild this thing from the ground up. 
Um, I'm a big fan of Luigi's Mansion in general. I love Luigi's Mansion 3. Um, but this one, we have the release date for this now. This is coming almost a month to the day after Paper Mario Thousand Year Door. It launches on June 27th for Switch. And this is, game is great, by the way. Most of you guys have never played it because it was a handheld game. And a lot of people just overlooked it for that reason. It's every bit as good as the other Lu Luigi's Mansion game, games. So I do enjoy that the poltergeist kind of looks like a virtual boy. Yeah. Which implies that the virtual boy sucks. <laughs> yeah. I actually did not put that together, but that's pretty <laughs> clever. And so anyway, again, that is coming out on June 27th. And then... We got a couple other smaller-ish announcements. We got some new Game Boy stuff coming to Nintendo Switch Online. There are three brand new games coming. Or actually, they're already there. They basically stealth launched. Dr. Mario, Mario Tennis, and Mario Golf all just launched into Nintendo Switch Online. Again, you need the, uh, the bigger subscription to access those games. Is it the 50 per year? I think so. Or 60. I can't remember. But you do need to have the higher subscription level. You can't just have the subscription level that you pay like the 25 or the 20 bucks just to play online. Um, but if you have Nintendo Switch online, if you're paying that higher amount, there are three brand new Game Boy games. What do you remember about these games, Matt? Anything? Mm, no, I've never played any of these on the Game Boy. They're, well, the sports games are actually RPGs. They're yeah. kind of like the progenitors of some of the games that have come since then, like Golf Story and things like that. Um, I do remember these games, and they were pretty darn good RPGs, if I remember correctly. It's been a long time since I played them at this point, but uh, if I remember correctly, they were pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. So, again, Mario or Doctor Mario, which is a great puzzle game, just kind of Nintendo's take on Tetris in some twisted yeah, way. I think I'd rather play the NES one though. Yeah, probably. And then again, Mario Tennis and Mario Golf, which are sports RPGs. The sports part of it passable. The yeah. RPG part of it is the bigger part I of the game. I mean, games. they're they're solid. You know, usually the, those are solid games in terms of mechanics. You're, yeah. you're talking about something at least as good as, like, Hot Shots Golf. Yeah, or, yeah they're arcade-style sports Or games. Virtua Tennis. What happened to that series? I don't I mean, know, but Top Spin just came back. Yeah. I, Top, I Top Spin like, I like 2K25 um, was announced, like, a week ago, and then today they announced the release date. It's coming in April, if mm -hmm. I remember correctly. So, But you're right. Tennis video games disappeared. There's a lot yeah. of... That's one thing I would say about the last couple generations is that the cost of game development has got so high you don't get a lot of the niche games no. anymore like you used to like what you, was you definitely wouldn't get sega superstar tennis again yeah or what was the volleyball game that sega released for gamecube what was that superstar striker no that's a soccer game yeah that's right what that was, was the volleyball um, game um from sega yeah I rem someone I, in I, chat I if i remember it's it. not wind jammers that's the no that's the frisbee thing but we don't get stuff like that anymore like because the game again games are too expensive or you end up getting them from an beach indie strikers? developer maybe something like that beach, beach spikers. spikers that's yeah. what it was yeah beach spikers. stuff like that like just and i have a like i have a buddy who used to be a professional volleyball player and i was home for the holidays he was talking mm -hmm. to me about games and he used to be a huge gamer like up and through adulthood like probably he made it through the xbox 360 era before he kind of fell off but he and i used to go through legendary mario kart battles and he, he used to be a huge gamer he was telling me like he's fallen off from gaming because that stuff doesn't exist anymore mm -hmm. he's like you know you talk about these games that i've never heard of he's like i go to the game store i look for games that are related to stuff i like in real life and he's like there used to be games like that. The PlayStation 1 era, PlayStation 2. He's like, anything you were into, there was a video game for it. He's like, I don't see it anymore. And, you know, he's not the guy that's going to go on Steam and dig through indie games and stuff mm -hmm. like that. He's one of those players who just, whatever is put on his plate, he yeah. looks at it. Yeah, they're just not in stores. That's Yeah. All. And so to him, he's well, like. Soon nothing will be. So. Yeah, right. To him, the industry has changed for the worse. Mm -hmm. He's like, you guys are, you know, The Last of Us? He's like, what is that? I'm like, oh, it's this zombie game. He's like, I don't want to hear it. I've played zombie games. He's like, I'm a volleyball player. It's my volleyball game. He's right. There's no volleyball game for no. him to play anymore. I mean, that's always been kind of a problem. Yeah. I mean, volleyball <laughs> games are not exactly common. I remember the, the first one I ever saw was on uh, Genesis, and it was yeah. just this weird side view thing yeah. that you couldn't even play properly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there haven't been a lot of them. But his point is that, like, I just have... I try to find games that relate to things I like in real life, and it's become harder for me to do that mm -hmm. over time, basically. I mean, I like zombies in real life. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so, I anyway... Mean, it's not like I go... It's not like you're playing professional volleyball, either. It's, it's a fantasy either way. Yeah. And then there was a couple other smaller things. We got the first announcement of the 
Super Mario Brothers Movie 2. Who knows what they end up calling it, but the sequel mm-hmm. to the Super Mario Brothers Movie is coming in spring of 2025? 2026. I would say probably 2026, six. yeah. Um, and they didn't say a whole word, lot about it? The word is there's two more playing, being planned after that, too. I mean, so. why wouldn't you? You'd be stupid not well, to. Especially because you're not going to have to worry about making any more Zeldas, I don't think. Yeah. Why? Because I don't think a live-action Zelda is going to hit. Yeah, <laughs> Either. Yeah, that's going to be a one and done deal. That's going like. to be because no matter how good it is, it's just going to be Dungeons and Dragons again. Yeah. And believe me, Dungeons and Dragons deserved to do better than it did. That's a great movie. Yep. Um, and then there's a couple other smaller things um, Lego stuff. So they announced mm. Lego Super Mario Kart. That's coming in 2025. Uh, they didn't say a whole lot about it. They put out a little teaser trailer that didn't show anything. No. It'll be interesting to see if it actually works. I would think not. Yeah. Um, it's probably just the carts. Um, That's what I figure. I mean, to they play, are, to they put already, in. They already kind of tried that, mm-hmm. you know, with the the big mark. You, you yeah, yeah. I played it, yeah. I still have it. <laughs> Sitting in the closet mm-hmm. collecting dust. <laughs> mm-hmm. a, lot of, a lot of stuff like that. I should, I should go see if my Steel Battalion controller is just covered in spiders. I wonder what that's worth now. Uh, a few hundred dollars. Oh, yeah? That's it? Yeah. Surprise. Shipping I mean, that would be a pain. Yeah, yes. I wouldn't want to do I mean, how many... I mean... How many uh, uh, people even have original Xboxes to plug that into anymore? Not a lot. I've always thought about pulling it out, but then a box is falling apart. It's probably, it's probably just full of spiders. And other stuff you don't want to get into. Yeah. Um, and then the final thing is they also announced a bunch of new Mario Lego sets that aren't Mario mm-hmm. Kart. Um, and that has been highly lucrative for Lego. Yeah, I don't see found, that ending anytime soon. Yeah, they've soon. found a real niche for the video game stuff. I mean, that they've done those. They've done Horizon. They've done mm-hmm. Sonic. I would love to see some classic Sega stuff. I'd like I'd buy a Shinobi uh, one or a Space Harrier. I would like these like classic video game scenes or yeah. something that kind of thing. You know, what, actually, you know what I thought of the other day that I that is I hadn't thought of in years from Sega that I think is probably lost media at this point. Planet Harriers. No, oh, yeah. They, like Sega had that in the lobby when we were in that building. Yeah, yeah. And we would go up and play it all yeah. the time. And like that's on nothing. Yeah, yeah. That has never been ported to anything. Yeah, that's true. Yep. There's a lot these, of those arcade these stragglers games. out there like that for sure. Yeah. You know, or like that that 360 uh, you know that that pod they used to like Sega used to have the three the R360. Oh yeah. That G-Lock in it. Yeah, that's and, right. And Galaxy yeah. Force. Like yeah. there's supposedly there's only 3 of those left in the world. Wow. That still work. I wonder where that one ended up. Um some executive's of, house probably. One of them is in Dubai. <laughs> oh really? Um one of everything's in Dubai. Yeah. Uh, I believe the other two are in private collector's hands. Okay. But um, nobody really knows. Peter Moore. <laughs> I feel like Peter Moore would have said something. We're about to talk about Peter Moore, actually. That's a ghost from the past. But now we're going to talk about a ghost from the future. Or actually, no. That's la- well, no, Next, we're going to talk about Sean Layden. <laughs> <laughs> a ghost, Another uh, ghost from the past. Ghost from the present in the past, sort of. He does. So Sean Layden, if you may remember, um, how was it? Five, six years ago now, he was the head of PlayStation Studios. Yeah. Maybe longer, actually. It's been. Yeah. Who can? Uh, 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 time moves weird now. Yeah. He was the head of PlayStation Studios for quite a while. Uh, back when they still used to do E3 press conferences, he was kind of the last guy um, mm-hmm. during that period. Um, he is the last guy stuck with that gig. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he had the job that Holman Hurst now has, the guy from Guerrilla Games. Who basically, you're the guy who's managing the entire PlayStation first party portfolio. And so he knows how game development works. And he did an interview with Venture Beat this week. And I'll just say, it is a great interview. You should go read it. It's curated to sift it right now. Um, we're not going to go over everything that was discussed. But one thing that Sean said that really stuck with me in the interview was that he says that he believes... It won't be too long before video games move to the same production format as film. Basically, you hire a bunch of people, they come in, they make the game, and when it's done, they all dissipate mm-hmm. and leave. How do you feel about that, Matt? I think that's unsustainable. Is it more sustainable than what's happening now, though? Because there, his yeah, point was that no, we're paying well, people to sit around waiting for work right now. Um, well, that's a management problem. That's not true. A, not a not a hiring problem. That's true. Um, the reason the film model works as well as it does is because making a movie is the same every time. Like, no matter what kind of movie you're making, the lights work the same. No matter what kind of movie you're making, the camera works the same. No matter, that's just how it is. Yeah. Um, that is not true of games. If you are not keeping around your people 
who know the ins and outs of whatever engine or whatever modified tools you're using, like you're going to have to retrain people every time, or you're just rehiring the same people over and over again, which at that point you're just like, well, you, we want us to, you want you to be there and available and ready for everything we want you to do, but we're not going to pay you full time and we're not going to like give you benefits. And yeah. like, like that's just not... Because that's what this is really about, Matt, yeah. is that you, if that happens, you do not have to pay your employees benefits. You don't have to do 401k mm. match. You don't have to provide yeah. health care. And the other reason the film model works as well as it does is because literally everyone in film is unionized. Yeah. Uh, and so no one can be mistreated uh, against those rules, and if they are, then some shit goes down. Except VFX, which really needs to unionize. So if this happens, you are literally asking all of game development to unionize against the publishers, um, which I don't think the publishers want. And so I would encourage them to figure out a way to just pay people properly and, mm -hmm. and not be afraid to have talented and skilled people be on your payroll permanently so when you make your next game and maybe plan a little better next time, uh, they can move right on to the next project. The other thing to remember... There are certain parts of the, game development, though, where you can't avoid the sitting around. Right. And that's, I mean, there's certain... But that's also true of filmmaking. Yeah. Half of movie making is sitting around waiting for no, the other true. crew to finish setting something up. That's true. Like, Why do you that's think... just how it works. Right. But film has already... You know, but film is unionized to the point that that's all covered. That's all handled. Unionization is starting to happen in games. Yeah, though. and it needs like to six hundred employees at um, Microsoft just unionized yeah, on Friday. And Activision today. Yeah. Um, but what I'm saying, and the other thing to remember is that most of you know, yeah, I, I definitely have been talking more with my game development friends about you know all that's happening and the layoffs and stuff. And mm -hmm. as one of them noted, who's been and this guy's been on everything. He's been on all the assassins, a bunch of the Assassin's Creeds. He was on Watch Dogs. He was on. He's worked in Triple A, Triple A, all and indie and every. He's worked mm -hmm. on everything. You know, he's worked at ten person companies and ten thousand person companies. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, he says the only and he says all you need to make a game is thirty programmers, fifteen designers, and a couple of leads. And then a ton of artists. Mm -hmm. He's like, the only difference between a double A and a triple A game is a thousand artists. Yeah, the assets. That's it. Yeah. That's all it is. Yeah. Um, it depends what kind of graphical fidelity you want. What we're looking at here, uh, this... Lots Last of artists. Of, Last of Us looks like this because <laughs> 2,000 artists worked on this for four years. Yeah. Every texture. That's Even that, that texture, that corkboard the texture cork right there, back there was made by somebody a great artist. Had, somebody had to figure out what all that text said on that little can. And model take, model that model metal it, can. Take a picture of a real can, yeah. model it so it's not <laughs> copyrightable, like, the whole yeah. thing. And, I mean, some of this is because the, the companies are starting to, well, maybe we can use AI to do this. Yeah. But one of the things they're slowly figuring out unfortunately after they've fired a bunch of people now is like you can't copyright that mm. ai generated crap is not copyrightable because, because you're taking it from somebody it, else and already scraped it from <laughs> other people who actually do own copyrights yeah on things. yeah and more and more they're finding people are finding ways to to basically trick these generate image generators into spitting out an image that's identical to the source material yeah and they've been doing it with disney movies which mm. is the fastest way to ensure some yeah. kind of legal action yep happened. <laughs> So that's the fastest way to shut it down yeah, immediately which is what needs to happen yeah um i mean it's a difference between like like ai i mean we people have used ai stuff what we would now call ai to help make games for 15 20 yeah, years yeah. Like procedural generation we is used to call them macros AI. yeah macros <laughs> or like or just tools sometimes that's just what tools I, I hear you. Yeah. Like no one placed every tree in skyrim yeah, personally yeah. that was a procedural gen and we would call that ai because we go to like ces or one of these tech shows now every single fucking company has whatever ai in yeah. the title now whether uh. what they're doing is ai or not because that's the hotness well that's how you get it's money like, it's like investors. everything used to be blockchain yeah or everything was crypto <laughs> like that's just how it is now so eventually they're going to learn that this is i mean like and there's ways to use it like uh, a guy who was doing like walk animations that gave the example of like maybe if i have like kind of a, a large language model that or that I can like plug in like five of my animation keyframes to, and then it spits out like 120 frames a second animation of the walk frame walk uh, cycle. Like that saves me a lot of time. Oh yeah. And I didn't use any stolen assets. Right. Yeah, I just yeah. put my own art into it, and it's like an internal tool that spits that back out. And now I've got this walking character. Yeah. Great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. But like, you still need the artist to do that. Oh, like yeah. that. He a person needs to be Start there it. and yeah. be paid to create that work. You can't. The, the, the machines can't create anything. Oh, not, I've learned this, Matt. And if they don't... <laughs> I've been trying to make the, the open for game phase with AI. Oh, it yeah. just wasn't ready yet. It's and kind it, of ready now. If you can get into the beta for that new thing that OpenAI did or whatever. It's still not... I mean, it does not creating anything. It's just, like, 
it's making well, it's text to video. It's basically. making collages out of existing art stolen from artists. Yeah. That like is such a detailed like mishmash, such a big mishmash that our eyes can't tell the difference most yeah. of the time. Um, but it, it can't create anything new. Like anyone who tells you that the AI is creating something is lying or stupid. It's just creating um, a potpourri, basically, right. from it, existing assets. Because if it could create something new, it's sentient. It would be scary and would, AI, and it would be in a fucking lab somewhere. <laughs> we wouldn't be. You wouldn't have access to Chat GPT if it could think. They're not thinking when you're not talking yeah, to them. Right. They, they don't have any independent thoughts. Yeah, yeah. And when they do, they are a new form of life. Yeah. And, and, and that's I, terrifying. And I assure you, <laughs> that new form of life will get very tired of you generating 4,000 stupid AI versions of Henry Cavill's Superman looking like a monster. Right. And then calling it cool. <laughs> yep. Um, so anyway, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I think for that model to work with game development, you're right. You're going to need to protect yourself as a developer. Yeah, it needs to change. It, like, the whole industry would have to change how they treat people and how people expect to be treated on a massive scale. And he may be right, but, like... I'm not sure any of these companies are ready to make that change. I think right now they're all scrambling, trying to figure out how can we still make games as good as we're making them now, but chop a hundred million dollars mm -hmm. off of the budget for them. Well, and the I just don't know if that's feasible. The American fiction screenwriter uh, basically laid that out when he in his acceptance speech. Uh, instead of making a two hundred million dollar movie, make ten twenty million dollars. I saw that clip actually, like, very compelling. Yeah, yeah. and he, then he said like make like make a thousand fit like make, make fifteen yeah. four million dollar movie. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. You don't have to dump two hundred million dollars in a movie to do well at the box office and turn a profit. And you can still make these big Last yeah. of Us productions. Look at Godzilla. But, but you gotta pick your fucking battles. Yeah. And or look at the creator. The creator mm -hmm. didn't win because it didn't have the positive buzz that Godzilla has. It was a bomb. Mm -hmm. Um. And sometimes if your movie's unpopular enough, uh, Academy voters just won't even watch it. Right. So that's one of the reasons Godzilla probably won. Yeah. But also because all during Oscar voting season, they were putting out positive stories about that. And Godzilla's just like, Godzilla costs five, the effect costs five million dollars. It's amazing. Yeah. The whole movie probably cost ten. That's what I, that's why I pointed to it. And yeah. like, if you can make it look that good, there's shots you in can that, that you cannot tell that that is not a model in the water. Yeah. And, if you can do that, you don't need to spend two hundred million. And also the fact that they planned everything. Right. That was the main because it helps that the the writer and the director and the VFX supervisor were all the same guy. Yep. He knew he didn't have to ask anybody what this had to be. He said, "I know what it's going to be, and I'm going to make yeah. it." Yeah. And more and more, you see, you know, and sometimes when you have some of the clear vision. Uh, the person sticking to my head right now is Stig, mm -hmm. um, because he just who his new studio just was announced new today. Studio today. That's why yep. he's that's why he's on my mind. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, that's one of the reasons I think Jedi Fallen Order was as good as it was was because he knew what he wanted to make, and it was and, on him to do it. Yeah, and when mm -hmm. and when you can then like distribute that to the whole team, everybody is sure. You know, if you can distribute and communicate what your vision of that is to effectively to your team, so the team can just think, what would Stig want us to do? He wants it to be like this, and they don't even need to stop and ask you. Oh, they, right. they know what we're making. Yeah. Like, that's a big deal. And more and more movies and TV, movies, TV, and games, especially at that giant budget level, they don't seem to know. And There's it becomes, and, and also because you're serving so many masters. Like, you're, you're, you got, oh, this executive gets input. This person thinks this. This person, thinks, you know, it's like, no, just make the fucking art. Yeah. Make the thing. Like you got to, you can't make the thing by committee. You have to actually do it. Yeah. Um, which is also what Dakota Johnson keeps saying about why Madam Web sucked. Yeah. So there should be some lessons there. I don't know if anybody's going to be smart enough to learn them, particularly at Sony Pictures. Yeah. Um, but anyway, again, that interview is up on Sifted right now. Check it out. He says a lot of other stuff that I feel is at least interesting. Will make you think about game development if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, next up, there was another interview with an old luminary, and I kind of teased this a couple minutes ago. Peter Moore did an interview with IGN. Peter, I mean, he's an industry stalwart. He was at Sega for the Dreamcast era. He went over to Xbox. Remember, he got... Is that tattoo real? No. I, it wasn't real? Of course not. It looked pretty good. It looked pretty real. It's good. It's, I mean, makeup's good. Yeah. No, he but he was really good. kind of the head of Xbox for a while. He's really been around. Now he's like... Is he the president of Liverpool football team in Europe? Yeah, he's, he's something like that. Yeah. yeah. He's uh, he's had quite a storied career, and IGN decided to catch up with him and kind of pick his brain on a lot of the stuff that's happening now. And one of the things that he mentioned, again, because he worked at Xbox, he talked about Microsoft and Xbox talking about not releasing another console after the Xbox 360. Mm -hmm. They've been talking about this console-free future at Microsoft and Xbox for a really, yeah. really long time. Which is why I've always assumed that Pactor talks about it all the time, because he knows those guys talk about it. Probably. That. Yeah, it could be. 
Um, but he, they ask him what he, they, he thinks now Microsoft should do, whether it should keep making consoles or not. And he basically said, like, yeah, it's probably time for Microsoft in particular to stop making mm-hmm. consoles. Now, he wouldn't go so far as to say, you know, there shouldn't be another PlayStation and Nintendo should stop. But He's, for Xbox, it feels, it does feel a little hopeless right now, right? A little bit, yeah. Not in terms of getting traction with Game Pass, but, but in selling terms of, consoles. In terms of the Xbox being on top the way the 360 was, yeah, like it just doesn't feel like that's ever going to be competitive that way. He made some very compelling points on why Microsoft should ditch consoles mm-hmm. um, because he's like, you got to realize when you launch a new console, that's like a five billion dollar bet. Mm-hmm. By the time you go through all the R and D and the actual production of the console, and then if something goes wrong, like he lived through the red ring of death at Xbox. So he has experience where, oh my God, we're in hardware and we launched it and it cost us a ton of money to do that. And now it's going to cost us double the money to recall these consoles. So he might be a little bit of a special case because he's actually scarred by stuff yeah, like he that. he sort of lived through the worst case scenario. Yeah, literally. Um, but he says like, you know, based upon what we, the talks that we had when I was there and what's happened since I was there, like it doesn't really make sense for Microsoft to launch consoles anymore. Um mm-hmm. And that ruffled some feathers, obviously, from for Xbox fans. Sure. Holding out hope that, you know. But, like, I don't know what you th- even as a diest hard, diest hard, <laughs> diest ex- Xbox fan, <laughs> like, what what do you think is going to happen? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't, short of getting GTA 6 exclusive, like, what could happen that could, that could change the, Xbox the tide to make that jump? I'm not even talking this generation. I mean, like, any generation in the future. No. Like, what, what was, would it take? What, yeah. I don't. I can't think of anything. I can't either. It would take GTA 6. It would take GTA... It would take Sony screwing up on a level that I can't even conceive because of. Because let's be honest, it would it's take a already kind of screwed up. Like, it's, yeah. I mean, it's been like 18 months. We've got one first-party game in 18 months. But they've got like, all the other games on yeah. the system, so it doesn't matter. And we've talked about many times about how people built their digital library on PS4, mm. and they don't want to turn their back on that and start building it again on Xbox. Yeah. You're right. Like, there is... The it's inertia hard to is even very hard fathom. to overcome. Yeah. It's hard to even fathom and, anything that Xbox can And do. I think now that you you know that your library carries over from generation to generation, it's a lot harder yeah. to suddenly gain traction at the beginning of a next the next one because no one wants to give up give that up. It's like trying to get people off Steam. Yeah. It's not you know, It's not going to happen. Not going to happen. As Epic Game Store is learning as yeah. it just basically just liquidates money. Literally giving <laughs> stuff away for free and I was like that's cool, but it's but not on Steam. I'm still so. going to Steam, yeah, to buy my games. It's yeah, there's just certain inertia that is the unstoppable object, you know? Mm-hmm. it's There's just so much inertia, it's not going to stop. I don't even know if GTA 6 being exclusive to Xbox would change it. That's the mm-hmm. only chance there is, but I don't, I don't, still don't think it's good enough. Yeah, I don't know what, what, it, would, what it would take. Yeah. And, like, no one would do that. Obviously it may it get you to 50-50 <laughs> with <Yeah>. PlayStation. <laughs> but it wouldn't win you the fight. What would happen is a lot of people would buy the console just to play GTA, yeah. and they just keep buying all the other games on their PlayStation. Or you'd need, I don't know, like you'd need, the, the new Xbox would have to be just markedly more powerful. Like, like double everything power. Everything would play better. Like, like even more of a disparity you want, than 360 You want 360 4K, 60 frames a second every single time the Xbox would do it, the PlayStation can't. Like that would be yeah. the only thing. I mean, that would only but, appeal to the really core yeah, people. That doesn't even work anymore. And you'd need exclusives that people have that have a mainstream fervor for in the way that they did for Halo 3. Yeah. And they don't have that. I just, man, I just watched on YouTube the other day a video of Halo 3 launch night mm-hmm. where these, this group of like five or six friends who are like 18 to 23, they're at home, they're setting everything up for their LAN party, they go, they film themselves going to the store to get all their snacks, they come back, they set everything up, they all jump in the ride, they go to GameStop, they get there, it's a freaking party, there's just hundreds and hundreds of people everywhere all over the parking lot, everyone's whooping it up, like, playing music, dancing, like, I miss that, like, that is just gone, like, I know you, you talk about you don't miss, I, I do, do miss that. Seeing that again, I was like, wow. Just like, give me the fucking game and let me go home. That I was, used to meet thing. people with those, though, that, like, you know, I, to be honest, I don't keep in touch with a lot of them anymore. Mm-hmm. But I did for a really long time. Like, I don't know. I miss That's that. That's you're interested in people. I'm not I am. So interested <laughs> in people. That's <laughs> funny. So anyway, um, if you talk to It made even more, less sense when it wasn't a multiplayer game. I was like, just yeah. give me my copy of Arkham City and let me leave. <laughs> like, what the hell? The other thing I would say, too, about this Peter Moore thing, this interview, is that, let's be honest, Matt. He's still talking to those people. Oh, sure. Like, he yeah. knows still what's going on behind the scenes there. So some of the stuff that he's saying in his interview, he could be a proxy where he's like, you know, he knows I some know stuff some stuff, sure. and this might be me greasing the wheels for some of this stuff that to come. So 
Yeah, I, I just I don't know what the answer. I mean, it is does feel like something's in the wind of like everybody sort of like you know whether it's rumors or stuff like that. It's just like mm-hmm. s- clearly Microsoft is at some kind of inflection point internally. Yeah, and no one really knows which way it's going to break. But you can see sort of all the possibilities being seeded out there mm-hmm. as like this might happen, this might happen. People talk about that. I don't know. It's like mm-hmm. it's almost like preparing the way. A little it bit. feels that way. Yep. So anyway, that's the latest on Xbox from somebody who probably knows. Um, we teased this last week because it was a rumor and now it's come true the day ghost, after <laughs> the ghost of tsushima is coming to pc um again it was a rumor in last week's show we got confirmation from playstation that it's on the way um are you gonna play this again on pc matt 100 percent. yeah i'm been wanting to replay it anyway but i'll i'll do it again on pc sure and it's gonna have all the bells and whistles the ultra wide support the dlss3 all the tricks that the mm-hmm. modern PC games have, this game is going to have it. Hopefully I think it launches well. I mean, Sony stuff is like 50-50 on good launches Yeah. so far. Um, but it should look gorgeous. And when uh, is Is it May? May. Yeah, May. May. So not long to wait either. Although we had to wait a while before it came to PC. Much longer than a lot of other yeah. PlayStation first-party games. But as games. I expected, like the when they did announce it, the release is pretty close. Yeah. So. yeah, they had been working on it for quite a while. So that's a pretty big deal. And and hopefully then, this is laying the groundwork for two to be mm-hmm. shown later in the year. Maybe, I hope so. Maybe in it's, June. It's overdue to show two. Um, particularly when you think about, you know, how little we know about PlayStation's first party output this upcoming, you know? It feels like it's probably time to start announcing some of that stuff officially, even though we know it's coming. Mm-hmm. It's probably time for them to start showing and talking about some of that stuff a little more because as PlayStation said, early 2025, we're going to get some sequel to one of its major properties. It didn't say which. Maybe it's Ghost of Tsushima 2. Maybe that's what's coming in early 2025, but we'll see. And then something else that was announced as a PlayStation exclusive that's also coming to PC is Gravity Rush 2. Now, this is a game that didn't do especially well when it came out. It kind of, some people were fans of it and really liked it, but yeah. it didn't sell very well. It kind of came and went with, with not much fanfare. Um, this Same game. With the first one, really. Yeah. It was, it was, they, they really wanted this to be something. Yeah. This game. Probably should have come to PC two years ago. Yeah, although there was a, I mean, there was a period where the the remastered versions of these two games were going for hundreds and hundreds of dollars Mm -hmm. because they were very briefly released on PS4 and that was it. Yeah, Um, these games were made by PlayStation Tokyo Studio, which I think was just disbanded in the layoffs. I think that was one of the studios that was cut. I don't remember if they were. so I don't know who's going to work on the PC. Probably Nixes, the same company that yeah, does all the, the same, stuff. It's the same port people. That yeah, it's been doing it like, all. I don't think Sucker Punch had a lot to do with the Ghost of Tsushima PC port. Probably not. Um, but this game is a no-brainer to go to PC. Like, they should just empty their back catalog of I'm stuff like this. I'm surprised they're not doing both of them. Yeah. I mean, they should just empty all the... Any game that's this old or older, go for it. No one's going to care. You're going to make more money yeah. off of these games than you I made. Would, I would buy Last Guardian at full yeah. price just to have a version that runs properly. Right. Yeah, because yeah. you're right. Like, the, the version that came out, it ran like crap. And it mm-hmm. wasn't quite up to the and vision they never everybody did, had And they never gave it a PS5 uh, proper upgrade. Yeah. Yep. So there's there's tons of stuff right now. In fact, I think it runs for a while. I don't know. Maybe they fixed it, but for a while it ran worse on PS5. Yeah. Yep. So there's so many games in PlayStation catalog from oh, yeah. PS4. The whole PS4 catalog I should mean, be on even PC. Even before that, I mean, like it's nice they're putting the the Vita or whatever Resistance game on. What? But where's the PS3 trilogy? Right. Like like save that stuff from that console. I don't. I think it's too much work. I think it probably. I mean probably, but it's like. I mean, it's it's a shame that, like, those games and the Ratchet games are stuck, stuck. there and the Sly games and... Um, PS3 was such a huge a mistake on so many oh, yeah. levels. Oh, yeah. You never should have been Kudarabi. <laughs> it's free just crazy. Cy- Cyber World did not pay off. No. Um, <laughs> it did not. Or, like, um, what was the other thing I was thinking of from that era? Um... I forgot. No. There's a bunch of stuff in there that I'm Oh, there's like, tons. You, you should rescue it. Like, a kill zone. Kill zone. Yeah. Like, like, I mean, I'm sure nobody wants to think about Killzone over Gorilla again, but it's like, why not? Like, it's, why not? It's a shame that those things are still like, streaming of that game. only. But like, I guess there's some of them on, on streaming, but like, that's not the same thing. Yeah. No. And I wonder if they literally just have like PlayStation threes sitting somewhere for the. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I mean, PlayStation <laughs> three Blade server. Right. Probably, I mean, I don't know how else you do it. I don't right? either. I don't either. Uh, so anyway, there you go. We don't have a date yet for uh, Gravity Rush 2, but it is on the way to PC. Um, And then next up, so Marvel Spider-Man 2 finally released its new game plus this week, Matt, 
and it was an unmitigated disaster. Oh, wait, did I just skip the story? Yeah. I did skip a story. Skip okay, so this story, Matt, you've been asking for something for a really long time that mm-hmm. finally came to fruition. However... And the monkey's paw curls. <laughs> However, it didn't work out quite as you hoped, and I guess, I'm guessing you're saying right now, not like that. No. So Matt has been asking for a long time for EA to actually recognize that it has this awesome back catalog of games and franchises and IP that it can make new games from. And finally, EA is like, all right, Matt, here's 11 games of our, from our old catalog that we're going to release on Steam, something that EA never does. And then what happened, Matt? Well, they're... First of not all, <laughs> really, not really the ones I was hoping. Also, they're all av- been available on GOG for years. Like yeah. these are the, none of these are new. These are the games: releases. Command and Conquer Ultimate Collection, SimCity 3000 Unlimited, Populous, Populous 2, um, Populous: The Beginning, Dungeon Keeper Gold, Dungeon Keeper 2, um, Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri, and The Saboteur. Mm-hmm. And some of those are good. Yeah, I mean The Saboteur is great. Mm-hmm. Pandemic's last game. Yeah, it's last ever game. Um, a couple of those Command and Conquer games are going all that, but it's like again, they were they've all been available on GOG for years. Yeah. Um. So if you wanted a version with DRM, here you go. <laughs> um. Like I, it's, I and it's I don't know. Like I, it's a good sign, I guess. Yeah. But don't stop. It's a here. start. Yeah. Right. Don't don't. This is you're not done. Yeah. Like keep going. Yeah. Let me see some other stuff that hasn't been around for a while. Um. It also resulted in a, a weird situation. For another game um, called uh, Potions, A Curious Tale, mm-hmm. which I've been playing. Um, so the, the story of... So the Potions... Uh, here's my curious tale about Potions. <laughs> so long, long ago, in the, the, wild, the wild and primitive year we call 2015, <laughs> um, I was on a show for a network called Fusion about star wars yeah. it was an official like by, by you know by lucasfilm was involved like we were making a real lucasfilm you know sponsored production working with about, lucasfilm. with lucasfilm with disney everything to um make a show about star wars video games because it was force awakens was coming out it was basically going to be like a big celebration of star wars video games um they changed that eventually to only highlight they wanted to just they said instead of being about the top 10 or whatever classics best star wars games they wanted to be about the ones coming out so it became going to Sweden to interview the Battlefront team and, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, I think Disney Infinity and and uh, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So that was a, but at the time, we thought we were going to have to get like, you know, we were going to do kind of like a I Love the 80s sort of thing about Star Wars games. Um, and so we were going to go, we'd already gone to D23 and gotten some interviews. I think we, I interviewed Chris Kohler for his stuff about that. We, we did get some stuff in the can for that, but we we're going to go to PAX in Seattle mm-hmm. and interview people just about their favorite video, favorite Star Wars games. Uh, at the same time, this other show uh, that was at the network at the time uh, uh, had uh, it was a show about online people trying to make a kind of online businesses their career or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they had this girl who uh, was trying to make a game about potion brewing, and they wanted me to set up interviews with people like up in PAX that she could talk to about getting it published or advice or how to and then that they could film it for the show. Mm-hmm. So I did. I set her up with a bunch. I think my friend uh, at, who does Devolver PR set her up with the CEO of Devolver, and like I mean, we got her some good access as far as I know. I didn't. We didn't go to PAX in the end, so only they do, they did. But as I yeah. understand it. She met a bunch of people and they all liked her and gave her, you know, ideas and and you know, what to do Tried and to help how her. to do it and yeah. it helped her. Eventually. And so, uh, and I didn't think much of it after that. You know, that, that that job was done. And then we did Star Wars. Um, we finished the Star Wars show, and the day or the day, the couple days before it was supposed to air, uh, that French terrorist bombing happened. And Disney's Disney's. Um, policy when something like that happens is to just shut down all promotion for a couple of days so our show got zero promotion nobody know it no knew it aired it aired we'd worked on it for like five months it aired no one saw it the end <laughs> you um, got paid yeah i got to go to sweden yeah for 24 hours we're in sweden for like 32 hours it was it, i think we were in the air there and back longer than we were on the ground <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> That's funny. Um, but yeah, so I was, and then the other day I wake up uh, and um, and I see on on Twitter uh, on my phone that she released the game, oh. like the potions Finally, of Curious Tale. Came time, after ten, she said ten years of working on, it, so she'd already been working on it for a couple years before we I set this thing. So in a very very tiny small way, I felt like I had 
contributed. You had a part to that. in that game releasing for sure. And right after she put it out on Steam, EA put all these games <laughs> out and knocked her off the new <laughs> releases page. That's brutal. Um, after ten years of work, right? And so she made kind of a tearful TikTok about how unfair she felt it was, mm -hmm. and at the end, kind of put in like a little bitter, like Happy International Women's Day because it wasn't. Yeah. International. And of course, all the chuds descended on her for like, uh, oh, it wasn't because you're a woman. I'm like, no, it's like if something bad happens to you on your birthday, and you're like, well, Happy Birthday to me. Yeah. It's like you think like, everyone the, says. It's it. not like you think the power company <laughs> shut your power off because it was your birthday. It's just like it's ironic that something that bad happens to you on a day that's supposed to be good for you. <laughs> Use your fucking brains, people. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, uh, but like, so, but in the end, like people kind of picked up the, the cause. And I, I, when I that day, when I lo when after all that, I, I finally loaded Steam up later that night, and I looked at and like the top new release was Potions. Oh, great! It was right on my page. It was it right all there. Worked out. And I don't know if that's because it was on everyone's or if because like Steam knows I play weird indie bullshit all right. the time. Yeah, <laughs> it could have been the algorithm. No, it's like yeah, you'll like this. Like, there you go. <laughs> You're doing That's a funny. weird thing with ingredients, and you're collecting <laughs> berries the whole time. That's what you like, right? We know you. Yeah. So, um, so even when EA tries to do something right, it yeah. does something wrong. It, it's, a, it's like the games I didn't want, and it like negatively impacted the one video game I had any tiny, small part of involvement yeah. in 10 years. So, yeah, yeah well done, EA. Yeah. I'm glad everybody got to play Command & Conquer General Zero Hour again. <laughs> You think this is gonna be the a harbinger of things to come? You think? EA's I gonna... hope so. I hope they start putting more. Because look, out it again. made we showed it to you guys. They made a trailer for this. Yeah, like, they, they they put some effort into it. I'm not saying like you know, ah, go away. Maybe they are. Maybe you just turn on the page here. I and... would like to see you know a little more esoteric stuff. I'd like to see stuff that like is more modern. You mm -hmm. know, like the, again, I think these are mainly because they already existed in, in modern working form on GOG, mm -hmm. um, and you can just throw. I mean, that command low Conquer, hanging fruit. That command yeah. and conquer collection has been everywhere. Right? Yeah, and it's a good collection. It's got everything. Literally mm -hmm. everything, including renegade which is still a pretty good boomer shooter yeah yeah um but like yeah i'd like to see a little more i'd like to see some weird shit i'd like to see black and white yeah those are those are basically missing yeah. media um i'd like to see battle for middle earth one and two but that's spore. a license, that's a license problem <laughs> spore is still available spore oh it is, is you buy spore on steam no it's it always been but i'd like to see like other you know um i mean that's, it's, the battlefront games are probably coming out in the collection so that's cool mm -hmm. but like little things i'm trying to think of like ea stuff that was like in the early 2000s that like maybe like we don't you know dante's inferno can you still get that i think you can still get that on steam i don't i think I, you can I, really yeah i'm surprised i think i have that on steam wow and i'm trying to remember sim city has kind of just disappeared some, some nice sim city collections would be good yeah. um Wing Commander, yeah. like they own Wing Commander, they own all of Origin stuff. A re some really nice Ultima remasters would be nice. Yeah, um, they have I, a huge. They're cap. all available on GOG in their original form, but it'd be nice to have something where the, in the inventory isn't like trying to figure out Python. You know, it's like <laughs> it's like some of that stuff is just awful. It is. Now. You know, yeah. you, you, we put up with so much weird shit on that because when you're a kid, there you're, was no you, plug yeah, and play back time, then, Matt. <laughs> and like, it, I don't know, I I don't remember playing like those old stupid like PC RPGs and stuff where all the everything's so awkward, and I ne it never occurred to me that i wasn't wrong you know what i mean <laughs> yeah like it was like it's like well clearly i just don't understand how this works no the fucking bag system in ultima 6 sucks yeah. okay like that's not it's not our fault we didn't do that the fact that you have to put something in a bag and then to hold that into the other bag you put the small bag in the big bag and somehow the small bag holds more yeah like that's not how, how bags work <laughs> But it is how bags work in Ultima. So, it's, yeah, it's... Um, Hopefully this is a sign of better things to come. Yeah, I, 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 first I, I would like to think so. Yeah. I, would, I, 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 hope, I hope there's some forward thinking here. I mean, like you say, the fact that they made a trailer for it, and if you notice how often they show someone clicking single player yeah, yeah. on that, that feels like intentional, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd like to see uh, this continue. I'm, I'm taking it as a good sign. Yeah. Um, but it's it certainly isn't the start I was hoping for. But yeah. like, hey, you got to start. Somewhere. Better than nothing. Yep. But with EA, you know that it's just like if you're going to start any kind of program or any kind of you know thing like this, it's like, well, it's the cheapest possible way. Yeah. And it's just take all the shit on GOG and put this it. This already Steam. we know works already. Yeah. But it, did, it seems to have done okay. Yeah. That stuff sold okay. People so care. Maybe, maybe uh, they will encourage them to keep going. People will come, Ray. Yep. Uh, next story, I kind of teased it a minute ago, uh, is related to Marvel's Spider-Man 2. They finally released the new Game Plus for the game, and this is just baffling to me, coming from Insomniac, Matt, but it... <laughs> so, inside the code, first of all, inside the code for the new Game Plus, when they started, like, decompiling it and digging into the code, they basically found the DLC roadmap 
for the game. Mm -hmm. So they know now what the deal is. It's like, is it Beetle or something like that? Is that what's coming? Beetle? Yeah, there's some, there's something that they found, some character. I mean, the Beetle is a, is a Spider-Man villain. Okay, well, I think he's part of the DLC that's coming, so they found that. But the worst part of it all was that they also included the debug menu in mm. the game. And, of course, players found the debug menu, and then Insomniac was like, don't touch that because it could completely corrupt your save. Mm-hmm. I, that, that did not stop anyone, no, as I understand it. I, I, from Insomniac, I can't believe this happened, Matt. Especially after the, the hack. Yeah. Problem, you'd think you'd have everything tight, lock. locked down. Yeah. Holy moly, man. What a mistake. And they're like, oh, we're going to issue a hot fix and blah, blah, blah. When everyone, and that's, everyone's like, take your stuff offline, stuff upgrade, update, because everyone wants to keep the debug. Yep. For whatever reason. I mean, I don't really care about that. But well, like, we don't care because we've had debug menus throughout our careers, right. like, People who don't work in the industry like we have, they've never messed around with a debug sure. menu before. <laughs> like, I promise you it's more fun to just play the game. It is. <laughs> yeah. As we learned very quickly, you leave the debug menus alone generally because it does cause problems. It'll make the games crash. And But anyway, it just to me, the oversight here by Insomniac is just, again, as you pointed out, after the hack, to just not have everything buttoned up for something like this. This is also, by the way, people were waiting for this new game plus for forever. It's been, what now, four or five months since the game launched? Like, we've talked about New Game Plus before. It's like, you know, a month or two after the game comes out. Mm. That makes sense. I mean, we're way past that now yeah, with this game. I mean, the first game didn't get New Game Plus until the first DLC right. pack. I don't yeah. remember how long that was after launch, though. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Insomniac had a lot of time to make sure this was all buttoned up, and they left the diva. I just, I can't comprehend it. I don't know how it happened. Um, it is one of the biggest gaffes I've ever seen from a major studio. Yeah, I don't... I mean, there have been weird things in... Th but this is... Like, the whole menu, just access to the dev menu is... It's crazy. Remarkable. Yeah, so... Certainly on a console game. Yeah. Like, I mean, be, being able to dig that out of a PC game is not that unusual. But, yeah. like, I mean, especially on a Sony game, I don't know. It's, it's bizarre. Like, um, I, when I saw that news, I read it twice. Yeah. I'm like, Re really? Like, Insomniac's had a rough couple of months here, man. Yeah. It really, I mean, <laughs> for a studio that's almost infallible in the past to have to go through a horrible hack, and then just to have, you know, this is all the Insomniac's fault here. And the layoffs, which, again, wasn't really Insomniac's fault. It's oh, no. The mothership, but still. You couldn't really perform any better than they did. Yeah. It's and, been yeah. a rough few months for Insomniac. I'm sure they'll be fine. Um, but it is a little bit of a blemish on an otherwise remarkable history as a game developer. And then we got some bad news this week, Matt. The creator of Dragon Ball, Akira Toriyama, died this week at 68 years old. Um, that seems young it is. to die. Um, did you ever figure out what happened? Subdural hematoma. Oh, so is that like an aneurysm? Mm, it's a it's a burst blood vessel in the brain between the brain and the skull, usually from a, a injury, it's really usually from a hit. Like it's like maybe he fell or something or uh, car accident. Is something. My grandmother, my grandmother's died from that in mm -hmm. her sleep. Uh, next, but there's been no details on it. Just okay. that they just said in the in the letter they sent out that that's what it was. Yeah, and we don't normally talk about anime and manga that much here on Game Face, but this guy's a legend. We make no, an exception a, for this guy. He's a one of the most influential artists on the planet. It's incredible. I mean, to like there, think... There are, like, China, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs put out a, a statement and an honor to him that is normally reserved for prime ministers and presidents when they yeah. die. Like, and it's estimated that Toriyama's work uh, resulted in over 400 million Chinese children reading his his work wow. and getting into comics and, be, and enjoying reading. Like, wow. Like, China credits him for, like, hundreds of millions of people being enjoying reading like he it, basically raised he, two of my nephews he um <laughs> I mean, his, 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 shows. his work improved chinese japanese relations yeah it's, it's, it's a remarkable he truly transcends. i am not a giant toriyama fan I, I was too old for dragon ball when it Me came too. here i yeah. don't particularly like the art style um it's just a certain combination of whimsy that it's I very unique though you really, see it oh, you yeah, know, immediately dragon, what dragon quest and chrono trigger cannot be argued yeah let's be honest you know i love chrono trigger mm -hmm. probably my i would say it's probably the best 16-bit square rpg maybe mm -hmm. square's best rpg of all time yeah um he did all the art in that um uh, for uh, Dragon, you know, obviously Dragon Quest. I mean, huge part of you. They, they, somebody was posting um, the requests for the creatures they sent him for Dragon Quest One and what he sent back, and like 
he don't give a fuck what they wanted. <laughs> like the slime was like this little gelatin thing. And he just draws back that fucking teardrop slime. Like of course you know, he's like. Oh, you want it to be like a weird little gelatin thing? No, here's the most iconic thing that you'll ever publish. Yeah. Here you go. There's, and he was there's right. a face of your whole franchise for the next 40 years. <laughs> he was right. Like, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> or like characters are like, she should be in a miniskirt. She's like, no. He's like, no, he sh- she shouldn't. It's a long dress. She's got a go. long sleeve like, dress. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like, if, and, he, and if that's what she was. You know, that's yeah. what they went with because yeah. he's fucking. And he's like, a genius. I mean, let's and be remember, honest. Dragon Quest is some, Dragon Quest was so popular. That when a new one would come out, so many people took the day off work that the productivity impact could be measured nationally. Yeah. It's, it was, for a long time, it was the biggest video game franchise in Japan. Period. Yeah. There this, was none this bigger. This man is, is, there are very, very, very few people in the world that can com- compare to his impact. In his, like, Spielberg? Yeah. Lucas? He's on that like level. You're in, you're in oh, yeah. that realm He's in that level. with these guys. Yep. Eve Demon says that Brazil did a day of mourning for him too. Yeah, Brazil, big, big, big everywhere. Like yeah. he just, and gaming, you know, look, games wouldn't be the same without him. Yeah. Like even if you don't like Dragon Quest or Chrono Trigger or anything, I mean, what's wrong with you? you don't like Chrono Trigger, but like his art is so influential. Like, uh, there's no way it would be, you know, the uh, same with what was the um, uh, Mario. Mario is Mario's run stuff is based on art he did. Yeah, I know the, it's crazy. Like if you go yeah. back and look at all the different Mario villains, especially in Mario Two, they're just Toriyama stuff. Mm-hmm. They're, it's literally based on stuff he put in in his manga. It's it's it. He's like a, he was a god. Miyamoto <laughs> Miyamoto just openly says I stole shit from him all through the eighties. Yeah. And like if Miyamoto says that, you know, yeah, you know it's 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 real. Yep. So rest in peace to Akira Toriyama. Um, our condolences to his family, mm-hmm. his friends, all his colleagues, all his fans. Um, I can see in our chat, you guys are a bunch of oh, fans yeah. too. Um, you're gonna, I mean, that next Dragon Quest game. Oh yeah, oh gonna Dragon be huge. Quest Twelve gonna yep. be huge. Uh, Mike's Q says also the Berserk author and artist had a huge influence on our lives. Yeah, like I said, Toriyama raised two of my nephews. Literally, mm-hmm. they're like. Still to this day, they're like adults now, yeah, and they the, talk about it. All the Mexican cartel ceasing activity in <laughs> yeah. morning. Like, like, that doesn't that's happen. For, that's huge. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, again, we don't talk about a lot of this stuff on Game Face all that often. Um, and we, we don't curate stories for stuff like this usually on Sifted, but we did for this one. Um, mm-hmm. I know I mean, the what game connects, even if you ignore the manga stuff and anime. The, even just the game, the game stuff alone. Is, yeah. It's not like Dragon Ball games haven't been a staple of, of video games for as long as they've been there. Yeah. You know, as soon as people could start, as soon as Dragon Ball existed, they were making video games out of me, even back on the old Famicom. Yep. So, rest in peace, Akira Toriyama. Uh, maybe we should have saved that for the end of housekeeping. Such <laughs> a somber note. Mm-hmm. Um, we got some more information on Switch 2 maybe this week. Um, there is an old patent that we showed you guys here on Game Face a long time ago. It looked like, and I tried to dig up the images on the TriCaster, I couldn't find them, but it almost looked like a closed like um, 3DS. It was like a, a sh- it was a clamshell designed handheld that like opened up, but then one of the screens detached off of the handheld, mm-hmm. and somebody was using YouTube the other day. And you know how on YouTube sometimes you don't get an ad and instead you get a survey yeah, that I immediately click through? Yeah. <laughs> well, a user got one of those the other day and it said, which consoles are you interested in buying? And it had PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X, and Switch Attach. Hmm. And so people are like, what? Like, did YouTube ads just reveal the name of the next Switch? Hmm. And so people are like, well, if it is the name of the next Switch, what does it mean? Then they started connecting the dots between that and this patent that we all saw like a year and a half ago or whatever for this detachable second screen handheld thing. That we, I think we kind of laughed it off. We're like, ah, oh, that's maybe an old patent or yeah. whatever. I mean, it, companies patent things they don't intend to necessarily use all the time. Mm-hmm. It's just to get dibs on it in case something happens. So, But trying to recapture, it just didn't seem like necessary to try to recapture the DS again. Right. You know? But that's what it appears this... Maybe, that's what they, maybe they want to recycle the DS library again. I'm just trying to figure out how it would work practically. Like I don't think it would. That was kind of why we we, we kind of blew we, it yeah, off. Yeah, we dismissed it. Yeah, like we couldn't figure out how it would work basically, and I'm still not sure what the purpose of it would be. I don't know, but it is very Nintendo to think that the way to follow the Switch up is to have a, a bunch more shit to stick on it. <laughs> and then, I mean, like like if somebody went back and looked at those old Game Boy ads where they've got all the 
lights and everything on top of it. And it's like, yeah, that's what that's what that should yeah. be. Yeah. Um, Where you basically turn it into a robot. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I am... Um, I mean, I guess the one thing it does point to is that Switch 2 may actually have a gimmick. Yeah. I mean, I feel like one of the strengths of the Switch was that it was its simplicity. Right. Even down to the fact that you could explain what it does with one word, which was the name of the thing. Yeah. Right? And you just slam it into the dock, and yeah. it's very easy. Visually, people could get it. Yeah. And now kind of trying to sell tons of... Ex- I mean, I felt like the accessory thing didn't really catch on with the Switch. Yeah. Beyond having to buy new Joy-Cons because of the fucking stick part. Yeah, yeah. Um, like... It's a weird thing to double down on for me. It feels like you didn't learn your lesson from Labo. Yeah. But, no, that's, um, that's actually a good, good But comparison. who knows? I mean, who knows what this was? Yeah. Um, and look, there is... People didn't do a ton... Like, nobody corroborated the story mm-hmm. and said, I also got the ad. It's just a weird thing to pop up in a YouTube survey out of nowhere. Like, who made that? Like, what was... Right. Switch attach. Like, you can hear that making... It, it does sound like something... It does sound It's sadly. just dumb enough to be real, right? Like, that's yeah. the thing here. And I'm look, I'm just going to say right now, it could be all BS. Because, again, nobody corroborated his story. Nobody mm. came in and no. said, I also got that survey on YouTube and posted a screenshot yeah, showing that they true. got it. So there is a chance that this guy is just looking just for attention and making yeah. it up. Um, like the guy who photoshopped the cornucopia on the Fruit of the Loom logo. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, but this news did make the rounds through all the various websites. It's a thing. Um, so we were just going to bring it to your attention. But, yeah, take this with a huge, huge mm-hmm. grain of salt. The other thing I heard that I didn't know before, and maybe it's not true, I don't know, but, like, it was the fact that the Mario Kart for the next Switch is going to be Mario Kart 10 because they consider the the Switch release of Mario Kart 8 to be 9. Really? Internally. Like, they call it Mario Kart 9. Weird. I hadn't heard that at all. It's, I don't know how reliable that was, but it's like, I mean, I guess nobody cares. Nobody I mean, cares. Nobody would care. <laughs> New Mario. And Kart. let's not forget, if you release that on March 10th, Mario Day, right? <laughs> and it's Mario Kart 10. Yeah, like that's synergy. That makes sense. Like I would yeah. skip a number. Just I mean, yeah. didn't hurt Final Fantasy 7, did it? We got to remember they also had Double Dash, which didn't have a number at all. Right. So it's right. how they've been counting them all along. Is just however they yeah, want to count. They count it. It. <laughs> so really it's up to them to decide. Which number they... Metroid is it? I don't know what day. What day do you feel like it being? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, pretty much. Who cares? Yeah. So anyway, again, take that news with a grain of salt. We just like to keep you abreast of like kind of all the news that's shaken out across the industry. Um, it's a possibility that it could be called Switch Attach. Um, just a couple more stories in our housekeeping. Next up, do you remember this fighting game called Multiversus? Yeah, I remember. It was, it's a, basically a Smash Brothers clone that includes all of Warner Brothers IP, essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, we literally played this in beta a year and a half ago. The beta wrapped up and then the game just disappeared. Literally, it's been completely MIA for over a year. I almost drafted this on my fantasy team because I was like, wait a minute, like, what happened to that game? It should come out this year. Sure enough, it is coming out this year. It finally has reappeared, and it is launching for good on May 28th. What do you think happened with this game, Matt? Um, I mean, I think they took it down to completely rework a bunch of it. You think so? Like, from the feedback on yeah. from the beta, they're yeah. like, oh, they're right. There's some stuff that we need to tweak. Yeah. I think, I think that's the most likely thing. Um, I mean, they've they've already made some questionable. I mean, the fact that Shaggy is based on a like eight year old meme mm. at this point instead of just the character that everybody just Shaggy. knows yeah. is uh, already kind of aging poorly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, don't know. I mean, I think this is a doomed. Uh, oh, you do? Out, like attempt one way or the I, other. We played it. I, th- I liked it. I thought it was pretty I liked good. It, but I just don't. Th- I mean. Smash Brothers seems to have an audience of one, which is Smash Brothers. Yeah. And. This is an interesting take on it, but it's not as good, and it's much weirder. Like, for, like these characters don't mesh the way the Nintendo characters do. Yeah, in a in a weird way, even though they aren't really more more different necessarily. Like, it's not like Superman fighting LeBron and Steven <laughs> Universe is all that weirder from you know Solid Snake fighting Mario. No, but like, you're right. For some reason, it just feels like the mix is weirder. Yeah. Well, it's LeBron. God LeBron no. is a basketball player. Yeah. He's also a Space Jam character. <laughs> yes, you know. yeah. Nobody wants to pay for Michael, so we're getting LeBron. <laughs> Bron, Bron. Um, I, I like this game when I played it. 
It was at that point. It was a beta. It was really light yeah. on modes and stuff also, like that. Also, let's not forget but... that it's a live service thing, and you have to do all the grinding or paying to get the characters unlocked. And Smash Brothers doesn't work that way. Like some of that, yeah. it's just a very obvious like attempt to get another live service game up and running. And we 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 certainly know that Warner Brothers has had trouble. With it that. just well, this, it just announced yeah. also that it's doubling down on games as a service. Yeah, so this, that like, might be, this might be the part biggest, of that. The biggest selling game of 2023 was a single player a Hogwarts game, but we're just gonna yeah. make sure. Well, how can we make Hogwarts more like the thing we put, just put out that bombed horribly? <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. And I recognize they're going for the infinite revenue thing, and they think that spending tons of money to make something that sells a bunch once and then doesn't anymore like isn't worth it. Yeah. But that's sort of how video games work. Yeah. So like the only Smash clone that's really had an extended lifespan is Ubisoft's Brawlhalla. Yeah. And a lot of that probably is just the deep pockets of Ubisoft. It's like, yeah, we can afford to keep. Yeah. Don't forget how long Ubisoft kept the roller derby game right. going. So yeah. I think it may still be going. Roller is Champions. It? I think it's still. <laughs> I think it's still live. I don't they think they must come... have announced that shutting down by now, right? You would think, but I don't think they have. I don't remember. I swear that they story. Did. They announced it that way. It should have. <laughs> I I'm swear sure, we there was something. I'm sure, there's a grand total of like four there. people playing it right now. Um, Vincent reminds us that Brawlhalla is on mobile, and that helps. Sure, yeah, yeah, for sure, that makes a difference. Um, but anyway, yeah. So this is coming on May 28th, and my guess is, you know, they've had a ton of time since the beta. They've probably added a bunch of stuff and done a, made a lot of tweaks and. Hopefully it's even better than it was when we played it the last time. I don't know. I, I, I bet they added, they added nothing. Maybe. Um, and they're I mean, just dusting sure they, it off. Have, I mean, I would hope that what they would add is stuff that they they have in reserve for the you know next six, seven months. Yeah. Because um, you're going to have to keep adding characters to keep this interesting. Yeah. Also curious if they can if they can branch out beyond the PG, PG-13 character. Because it's like, as long as you're being weird, like, throw in the Matrix people. Yeah, why not? Like, I mean, you got Game of Thrones. Yeah. So obviously, adult stuff is fine. Okay. You know, yeah. Throw in Game, throw in the Matrix, throw in, uh, throw in Clockwork. I mean, Orange. they have tons. Okay. Of, oh, that like, would be awesome, man. So if they some, played. What if they played like, um, like Ice Climbers in Smash, where there are yeah. like a crew of people, but they're actually one character yeah. that you control. Smash Brothers. That would my be groups. awesome, man. <laughs> that would be great. A little uh, bit of the old ultra violence. Yeah. Um, so anyway, Multiverse is coming May 28th. It's coming to pretty much all platforms, and we'll take another look at it whenever we're ready to review it here on Game Face. And then the final story for housekeeping for episode 380 is something that just broke this morning as well. It's another Insomniac game story. So we Which know we, we knew about this from the hack, but yeah, we knew about a trailer, it from the hack. Right? But we have a, yeah, we now have a trailer of Insomniac's multiplayer-focused Spider-Man game. The title was Spider-Man: The Great Web, and I'll just say it: this game looks kind of awesome. Like, you know, this is a mandate mm-hmm. from PlayStation. It wanted all its studios to work on multiplayer-focused games, so a lot of its big studios started working on projects like this. Um, and they made a multiplayer-focused Spider-Man game, and it looks pretty awesome by this trailer, and it was so far along that they had a trailer for the game. Um, and then it was canceled. It, it really is crazy, Matt, how much work is mm-hmm. wasted in the games industry. How many games like this get really far along and then just get killed for who knows what mm-hmm. reason? Well, especially like, considering like there's no better way to tie into, sp- into the Spider-Verse than this game like you're you're here's all the characters that everybody is fucking hyped about now yeah because of, because of those movies yeah and this would probably come out right around the time that third movie finally shows up in two yep. years or whatever i do fear that this is going to um issue the episode of copyright strike probably i would think so <laughs> i didn't think about it this but morning I mean, and I'm, I'm also concerned that this is the thing that that was being teased by some of miles side mission stuff in two and we're just never gonna hear about it again yeah it's possible shame yeah um, I'll show it once on the show for our live. But all those we'll see if it makes it through YouTube. But all those filters. characters would be cool to play as those, uh, all those characters, um, especially if they differentiated them well enough. Mm-hmm. Um, the Great Web is a reference to uh, the comics where um, the Great Web is actually a Madam Web thing. Oh, really? Where the Great Web is sort of the, the Spider Verse, basically. It's, the, it's the, all the all the strands that connect every Spider person throughout the multiverse. Um, uh, it's a cool. It's a good idea. 
It lets you put all these kinds, all these different villains in classic versions of. You know, that was like a classic version of Doctor Octopus you saw there. You mm-hmm. Use any version of anyone you want. Like it frees you up to do almost anything Spider-Man related. It was. It's a good idea. It's like a cooperative game yeah. too, which yeah. is great. Like PvP doesn't really work, but which if only there was some example of a cooperative game really hitting it big so far <laughs> this year. Oh wait. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't cancel that Sony! game. Sony! I'm surprised they didn't cancel that game, too, honestly. Yeah. But it's probably so far along. They're I'm just surprised like, ah. that after that, they're like, hey, we should bring that fucking Spider-Man game right. back. <laughs> yeah. So we'll see. Hopefully I don't get a like copyright. if you think Helldivers did well, you think, what do you think? Come on! Right. Look at it's that! It's Spider-Man. <laughs> I know. Look at that! Again, mismanagement from the PlayStation camp. I'm not sure what's going on there, man. It does seem like it's in disarray. But what it... in the world would make you think canceling the Spider-Verse game was the right move? Hell, cancel the Venom game and put that out instead. No, right. What are you, crazy? It would do better. I agree. Yep. And I don't even like multiplayer. Yeah, yeah. You it's would just... probably enjoy that, though. I'd try it. But yeah. it's just like, it, it's just so obvious. Yeah. And like Marvel stuff never well, hits don't when forget, the iron's hot. Spider-Man 2 just sold like yeah. gangbusters. Just a few months ago. And that's, I mean, the, the Spider-Verse thing is the hottest thing in Spider-Man. Like Imagine this. if they put that out in, like, June or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. I don't know what's going on at PlayStation, man. It's too, it's like we said. It's full of itself at this point. It knows, just as we know, it would take something catastrophic for Xbox to somehow mm-hmm. be competitive. It's, that's the problem with the lack of competition. Is yeah. that they can just do whatever and the hell they want. And believe me, if, if Xbox stops making hardware, that's going to get worse. It could get worse, yeah. So anyway, there you go. That's our housekeeping for Game Face episode 380. We're about to get on with the bulk of the show. But before we do that, here's a word from our awesome sponsor, LS Cream. LS Cream is a fine cream liqueur created by fellow gamer and sifter, Stevens Charles. It's inspired by an ancestral recipe from Haiti called Cray Mass and a double gold winner for its original taste at the New York Wine and Spirit International Competition. Ellis Cream can be enjoyed on the rocks or as a mixer for drinks with its rich blend of fresh cream and neutral grain spirits with notes of coconut, vanilla, cinnamon, and nutmeg. It's great in coffee or to make espresso martinis. To learn more, discover amazing drink recipes, or to track down your own bottle using a handy store locator, head to creamls.com slash sifted. That's creamls.com slash sifted. That's right, sifters. Head to creamls.com slash sifted. Again, most awesome liquor website ever. Has everything there that you need to find your own bottle of LS Cream. You can get it at your local store. You can order it online. If you do go to your local store, this is what you should be looking for. This is the bottle you're going to find in stores. I love that bottle. Very iconic. Very easy to pluck out from all the other liquor at this liquor store. So, again, go to creamls.com slash sit that I do want to bring up that is very important that if you guys can, if you support our sponsors here on Game Face, um, and if we give you a URL that has our name in it, Pre, pre, try to use that because our sponsors use that to try to figure out if you guys are actually resonating with our sponsors to keep sponsoring the show. So head to creamls.com slash sifted. If you want to buy LS Cream, um, make sure you use that URL to do it. That way the folks, the awesome folks at LS Cream um, know that their sponsorship with us is working and they're selling bottles of their liqueur. And again, I cannot recommend LS Cream high enough. It mixes well with almost anything. Go get it. Go to creamls.com slash sifted. And with that, it's time to kick off the show proper. I do think maybe I made a mistake stacking the show. I don't know if this is the biggest thing in the show today. It was hard. It's kind of like splitting hairs with today's show. I don't even remember what happened in it, and I watched it. Oh, really? (laughs) And you watched it? Yeah. Um, Well, last week, Xbox had what it calls its partner preview, and it's basically its Xbox's chance to show off the third-party games that are coming to its platforms that it's not making, that other people are making. Nintendo just did something similar like a few days earlier. We talked about that last week on the show. Um, and I will say this, Matt. One thing I'm starting to realize about this year is this year might be the year of the B-tier video game. Mm-hmm. Um, so you figure Xbox showing off third-party stuff right after Nintendo did. Um, they're different because some stuff just simply can't run on Switch. But I figured the Xbox event is like, okay, here's where we get the first real look at the third-party landscape for 2024. The real third-party landscape. What's I don't actually... know why you think that. Why? Because 
the real third party landscape is going to be in Sony's. Oh, maybe. That's where the that's where the money is. I guess it is. I mean, if you think about it, that's where mm-hmm. the bread is being buttered right now. Well, maybe to your point, Matt, that's why this was loaded with a bunch of basically B tier games. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it is going to be a B tier year in a way. I mean, just there's no everything that was supposed to come out this year got pushed because the stuff that was supposed to come out in 22 got pushed to 2023. Mm-hmm. 2023 ended up having all tons of great stuff in it, but no one's ready with anything this year. Yeah. Well, here's one thing I'll say, though, is that, at least for me, this partner preview, there were a bunch of games that caught my eye, and I was pleasantly surprised by some of them. There were a couple games that had been announced already, and we'd known about for a while. There was a bunch that were just announced for the first time, but for me, the overarching theme was, yeah, these games are coming from smaller developers, but a lot of them have creative sparks that I think could maybe make them become something to watch. Mm -hmm. Uh, The first game we're going to talk about is a game called Unknown Nine Awakening. Um... What did you think of this one, Matt? Um, I don't remember it. You don't remember it? No. This one had been announced for a while. Um, so I've heard w- the title, but I don't like... Oh, yeah. It was, um, it was an I- indie game, but Bandai Namco picked this up for publishing. It is coming out this summer. I is- don't really know what it is still. It's um it's an action adventure based on a novel of the same name. Are you familiar with that novel? Me no. either. I had never heard of it before. Um, it follows a young girl in India who has mysterious powers, um, and that's pretty much the extent of what we know about it right now, other than what's been in this trailer. Kind of looks like Vanishers, except you have more people in you. <laughs> that might be a good, might be a good way to describe it. Um, I like the cultural angle of this game, but again, visually, you can tell it's not from one of the top studios. I think the art style is pretty cool. I like the setting. I like the concept behind the game. Um, and again, it's showing some promise if Bandai Namco picked it up, a major yeah. publisher. It wasn't picked up by some little indie guy. Um, it was no. picked up by no, a it major fine. publisher. It, it, it kind of has, uh, what was it? It kind of has um, uh, PsyOps feel. A little it, bit. bit. But it's just... Well, it's more of like a. It feels like there's more. It's more of like a time manipulation thing. Yeah, but she's also like blocking stuff and throwing things around. I don't she know. can pause it's time, it's freeze a ter- time. It's a terrible, terrible title. Yeah, but you're right. It does have a little bit of that mind gate conspiracy, holding the hand up and mm. doing that whole thing. Um, this game is also coming to all platforms, and yeah. most of these games are. They're not just coming to Xbox. Yeah, I mean, maybe. I mean, I'm looking forward to that Outcast sequel this week. Right. So we're, 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 in, a, we're in a place right now. We'll be now. talking about that game next week, Matt. Mm. <laughs> I could just foreshadow that right now. But anyway, this game is called Unknown 9 Awakening. It's built by Reflector Studio. It's published by Bandai Namco. And again, it's coming this summer, just a few months away. Next up, a game called Sleight of Hand. This is from a studio called Riff Raff. Um, they did not show any gameplay for this game, but basically it follows a witch that uses cards to cast spells. And she, the like the VO in this is very tongue-in-cheek, very funny. This, tra- this trailer is pretty clever. Um, but you basically play as this girl who uses cards to cast her spells. Um, and she's like hunting for her master or something like that. I can't remember what the basic plot of it is. She's uh-huh. like... She's either hunting for her, the person who, like, was her protege, or she's the protege, who, her master, essentially. Um, but again, this is a cinematic trailer. They didn't show any gameplay for it. The trailer is only about 35 seconds long, as you're about to find out. But I thought the concept was rather intriguing. Um, I do like the art style that's in the trailer. Who knows if that's what the actual in-game action will look like. Um, this game is also coming to multiple platforms. It's not just an Xbox game. What do you think of this by looking at the trailer, Matt? Um, it makes me think of um, We Happy Few. That, and it also wise. reminds me of Redfall. Yeah, it does have a Redfall look to it. Particularly yeah, the first trailer that they released yeah. for Redfall. Gameplay-wise, it makes me think of um, Lost Kingdoms. Uh, <laughs> well, it's, no like a, it's basically a stealth game. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's got probably got some... Um, uh, what you call it? It's, it's a little bit of uh, uh, Dishonored in there yeah definitely can see that in the art style for sure um, i don't know i like the i like the card idea but it's, uh, i'm gonna need to see gameplay yeah um and then as vincent points out in chat this is a this property unknown nine it's not just a game this is some multimedia thing that they're doing which mm-hmm. is probably a big reason why um it got picked up for this this mm-hmm. event particularly when it's just a cg trailer and it's not showing any gameplay it's from a smaller studio 
Yeah. Um, Although I, I mean, I could believe that Unknown Nine was in Engine. Yeah. Um. So anyway, that's Sleight of Hand. We don't have a ton of information on it yet, but more should be coming. Next up, are these supposed to be this year? For what? This Unknown this Nine showcase? is this year. Um, Sleight of Hand is not for this year. Mm. They're just showing whatever they got. Yeah, yeah, which was just that CG trailer, yeah. basically. Um, next up is a game that we have known about for a while. It's a game called The Alters. It is another one of those games where you oh, clone right. yourself to solve puzzles. And uh, you, you basically you play as a miner who crash lands on a planet. It's basically a su- survival game set on what looks like a halo ring. Um there's some kind of weird substance on the planet that lets him clone himself, and thus the name alters. You can alter yourself. Um, and basically what you can do is you can change decisions from the lead character's past um, to affect the future, basically. This is under development by the studio that worked on This War of Mine and Frostpunk. I think it's called 11-Bit Studios mm-hmm. or something like that. Um, but yeah, the Halo ring there, the iconography there. Halo ring? Yeah, I mean, I'll just rewind it real quick. It looks like a halo ring. Where? That big ring there. This is a facility, right? Yeah. That's where you go. That's where the game takes place mostly. Um, you're in that big ring shaped facility. Mm. Uh, but it's, it's, I think it's more driven by puzzles than anything else. It's all about like cloning yourself and then using the clones to solve, like, ver- you can see here, to solve mari- various um, mind puzzles. It's probably the most unique game that was shown. During the uh, the partner preview, but again, it's coming to a bunch of platforms. We've known about this game for a while now. This is kind of its big coming out party. This is the first time it's been featured in like a big event like this. Before we got like a couple trailers for it and some information, um, but this is the first time it was really blown out for an event where a lot of people were watching. So now, obviously, it's on everyone's radar. Uh, next up, a game called Creatures of Ava. This looks just like Rare's game. What's it called? Um, Everwild. Yeah, Everwild that we'll probably never see released. Art style looks mm-hmm. the same. The concept seems very similar. It's a little more whimsical. I'd yeah. Say, you, like, yeah. It's kind of like Pokemon Snap, really. It's like an indie Pokemon Snap. It's from a studio called Inverge. Um, and basically, you're like the Pied Piper. You have animals that follow you around. You take photos. It's a passive sort of game where you're just basically managing like the wildlife in the area. Um, Here's another example of something that like Nintendo could have done this already if they wanted to, but, but chose not to. Yeah, for a reason. <laughs> yep. But this game, I think it looks pretty good. I don't know if the Xbox market. This is something that that market is pining for, but I mean, you never know. Weirder things have hit. Well, what's weird to me is that this game is in Microsoft's thing, and ever while we haven't seen it for like three years. Well, they didn't know what the game was <laughs> last time we saw that. Um, so anyway, again though, this is a unique game that isn't like a lot of other games, uh, and it's definitely not like a lot of other Xbox games. But it is coming to other platforms as well, like pretty much everything else in this presentation. Next up, we got the release date. For the Sinking City 2, this game looks like a Silent Hill ripoff to me. Did you play the first Sinking City? Yeah. What well, I haven't played it at all. What is it it's like? A, it's an open world kind of action. Not open world, but it's an action RPG. It's very detective focused, very puzzles focused. So you mm-hmm. have to like uh, find... Uh, there is shooting and killing things, but like the most of the action is going places and investigating them. And he has some ability where he can see what happened you know kind of kind of uh kind of like banishers okay uh but you can you can kind of see what happened and there's like like the first thing is like you find this dead guy and you kind of look around through the 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 spirit realm or whatever the, the you can see the past and you see like these guys ran off this way and you track them to a warehouse and figure out who it is and who killed him and what it's that kind of thing okay and so you're kind of a you're, you're a private detective and you're also you're trying to solve you're, you're in um you know lovecraft city and like you're trying to basically and there's a lot of like side stuff there's a lot of dialogue choices where like you have to you know gaining favor losing favor with the different factions that are fighting over you know there's the fish people and the and the ape people because there's like it's it's it actually leans into into a uh, uh, lovecraft's weird like there's you know the inzimuth people who are like fish you know they, they crossbred with like the dagon fish people and like the the brutish like ape people who are like you know like a, they're a proud lineage that were not sullied by human genes and stuff so they all kind of look like 
like gorillas. Okay. Um, which in Lovecraft is way more racist than it is in in the, the game. Mm-hmm. Um, although there is some of that, uh, and they have a little warning at the beginning. Uh, the most interesting thing about this to me is that the company I can't remember the name of the company that developed this, but they lost that game for a while to another to I think Piranha Bytes or some other some other public to the publisher. Weird. And they were not allowed to make it makes more stuff to it and a bunch of the stuff went that got removed from Steam and a different version went up that had all is like they rolled back this patch or so some some patch didn't get applied or something so like there's all these extra bugs that had been fixed but then they stopped having the patch in it because they didn't have the rights to it mm-hmm. and then the devs got the rights back like in the last couple months or something and then they're self pub so they were self republished <laughs> the first game as like a new skew kind of and added all the fixes and all this DLC back into it and so now like you can actually play it on all the platforms properly interesting and if you buy it now you're actually giving money to the developers and not the people who stole it from them basically like it was kind of like a weird switcheroo thing that the publisher pulled I can't remember the publisher was either but basically it's never been a better time to play the Sinking City 1 but I was stunned that like a week and a half later they're like oh Sinking City 2 is coming and it's coming pretty soon yeah oh by the way I, I had this wrong this wasn't the release date trailer this is the debut trailer for this yeah game. this, this is the first debut. look at it but yeah. like the fact that it's even this far along in terms of that is like I'm they shocking. had faith that they're gonna get it back yeah, they basically. knew they knew it was coming apparently. yeah so uh no that sinking city is pretty good as you know lovecraft games are never amazing really mm-hmm. but as those go i thought sinking city was pretty good okay um if you're gonna play it i would strongly recommend pc okay because it's it runs a lot better. All right. It, it's the the console versions are a little, you know, uh, but you can get it for pretty cheap at most sales. They because it's been out for years, years like seven years or something. Okay. Um. Yeah, it's more detective focused than it's not. A, I mean, it is a horror game, like it's a Lovecraft, but more of the more of it's like just weird shit in this city. Um. And there's a lot of navigating the city and going to different. Districts. Sounds a little bit like Alone in the Dark, honestly. Um. Particularly the new reboot. Much less combat, I yeah. would say. Um, and in fact, the, I, I would actually, I, probably the best, maybe the best comparison might be Vampire Bloodlines. Oh. There's a lot more dialogue than okay. you might think, and a lot of puzzles of investigation stuff. Um, there is combat, but it's not the focus of the game. Okay. That's The Sinking City 2. It's also multi-platform, um, and it's, I think it's release date's like 2025 or 2026. Yeah, next year somewhere. It's still a ways if, away. If you're lucky, I think. Yep. But I, I was expecting that to be way, I did not expect an announcement this soon from Yeah. That. Um, and then next up, a game called The First Berserker, <coughs> Kassan. This is... We've seen this before. We have right? seen it before. Yeah. yeah, this is the second time that it's been shown. It is an isometric Souls-like. As you can see, very gory. Um, do you feel like we're going to reach saturation with Souls-likes? Have oh, we reached I've, it already? I've, I reached saturation with Souls-like long ago. Yeah. Also because, like... There, none of them are as good as the From games. Yeah. Like, they're all just imitators. Well, it like feels imitators. like you're always looking for the one that's as close to the From games as possible. Yeah, and I'm not, I don't think this is it. Yeah. Um, there's nothing striking about this game that makes me remember it, other than the long white ponytail, the yeah. long white hair. He's got a memorable design. I guess the kind of the slightly cell shaded look is different. Yeah, the art style's a little different. You're right. I mean, honestly, it just reminds me of Berserk. Which uh, which is <laughs> makes very sense. similar. Yeah. Which makes me wonder, like, why don't you just make a Berserk Souls like? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's big monsters and parrying. Like, I will I say, I am surprised that you're not into the Souls likes that much. They take a long time, and they're a big time commitment, and none of them are as good as Frums. Like, so you're why like, would, why would I? Burn why wouldn't my I time? just replay one of those? Yeah, I hear you. Like. It's not worth it to me. I mean, I still have half of Elden Ring to get through, mm-hmm. and I'll probably never get through it. So it's I'm going to always have that there for me to go back to if I get an itch to play these games, which with me doesn't happen all that often, to be perfectly honest. They're just not really my forte. Um, but that game is also coming to a bunch of platforms. It's not just an Xbox exclusive, just like all the other ones. Um, and then we did get a release date trailer. It wasn't for The Sinking City 2. It was for Frostpunk 2. And that's why I got the two things confused. The first Frostpunk was kind of one of the first survival games that really kind of went off. And I would argue it's one of like a few games that kind of kicked off that whole kind of... That's another genre to me, Matt, that is just so oversaturated at this mm-hmm. point. Like 
And, you know, if you watch Game Face, you know Matt and I aren't huge survival game fans. Um, this one's at least unique in that it's like more of a city building survival. Yeah, game. it's like a hybrid almost. Like yeah. it's not as it's not as much of a turnoff to me as it's like having to make a character drink every five minutes and eat know? food constantly yeah. and stuff like that. This also became a, a rather good board game. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I've, I've heard that. Obviously, I haven't played it, but I've heard that. Um, Frostpunk Two is coming out July twenty fifth, twenty twenty four. So if you are into survival games, this one, as Matt said, doubles as like a city builder. Um, and, you know, I think you're working more on the macro level in this as far as the survival part. You're worried yeah. about the whole city instead of just some little, like, camp where you have, like, eight people and a little fire and you have to make sure that you're bringing deer back to the spit to, like, feed people every day. It's a, it's a bigger scale in this game than what you get in a lot of other survival games. And, again, the world building gives it a little bit of a unique angle. Mm. It is one of the most popular survival games on the market. So... Yeah. Um, for a good reason, there's a sequel for this game. But again, for me personally, it's just not my jam. No. Will you play it? Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I didn't really care much about the first one. Yeah. Is that? I just get frustrated by city building games. Yeah, me I, too. I, I, I. A lot of times, I end up hitting a glitch and I just quit. I just never. I just <laughs> never. Just quite, like I'm not gonna keep playing. I, it, it always hits a point where I have to look up what the game actually wants, because mm-hmm. like, I never quite figure out the systems of how. You know, it's like, oh, I need to do just the Googling. plumbing this way. <laughs> it's just like great. You know, it's like, yeah, it's it's just not an interesting thing to me mm-hmm. for the most part. I don't. I'm not. <laughs> if I wanted to do that, I would have gotten into city planning. Yeah. In, in real life, you know, yeah. it's like, yeah. Um, Farad all says frogwares. Yeah. yeah, that's the that's the sinking city. People. Yeah, frogwares and. Uh, the publisher was um, Big Ben, which I've never even heard of, I don't think, beyond that. I've heard that. of them. But they're not a big indie no, publisher. No, they're not. They don't release stuff very often, for sure. They feel like It feels like they faded over the last Well, maybe five because years. they keep screwing their people over. Could be. So, But Frogwares has it back now, and everything's okay. Yeah. Go, go, get, go get Sinking City 1 to support them if you can. Okay. And then the final game that we're going to mention here today from the partner Xbox Partner Preview is a game that is right on the fringe of being worth mentioning. It's a game called Monster Jam Showdown. It's a monster truck racing game. Well, here's one of those games that they don't make anymore, like yeah. you were saying earlier. Well, Monster Jam is the franchise. So the yeah. last one came out like three years ago, but you're right. It's the only franchise left. Where you can race monster trucks, and it's and as you can see, it's not a great looking game. Um, and this isn't just about like racing. You also have like all the arena events where you do like goofy freestyle tricks and all that kind of stuff, as you can see in the B roll. Uh, but this game is literally coming to everything, even Switch. Um, and I think it's coming here in the next couple months as well. But that's called Monster Jam Showdown. And then they announced a couple other things that we just mentioned in brief. Uh, Roblox, there's like a Chucky, like Roblox DLC, like Chucky the little doll murderer, mm-hmm. like yeah. Roblox DLC. Yeah, something for the kids. <laughs> uh, they announced the I mean, release. He does fit with that art style. I he kind of, because he looks like ass, pretty much. Um, Final Fantasy fourteen is launching on Xbox March 21st. Mm-hmm. So we have like 10, 9, 10 days from right now. Uh, before that's finally launching something xbox owners have waited for for a really long time uh they shadow dropped the stalker collection the original trilogy stalker which Um, is uh not great yeah um it's two reasons partly there's a lot of crashing there's a lot of problems clear skies in particular is unstable as all hell and it always has been on it always has been yeah Yeah. on both both platform playstation as well Mm -hmm. um and they, apparently they are going to implement mod support eventually on the consoles, but right now you're just playing Vanilla Stalker, and um, Vanilla Stalker sucks. <laughs> um, yeah. You, you, there's almost no one in the Stalker fan community that isn't playing with at least some rebalancing mods. Yeah. Like, you really need They're hard. These games are hard. They're hard, and they're hard for stupid reasons. Right, because they're like kind of the, busted. Like, the, the, the damage uh, and, and life in the in, of the enemies in the player like, in, like it's actually easier on harder difficulties in some ways because basically the 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 damage is higher but that means you can kill things quicker right so like yes you're taking more damage but a headshot's gonna kill anything mm-hmm. so like what do you want you know yeah a lot of stuff like that um if you're gonna play the stalker games and you haven't already uh go get the pc version and and look up a mod guide and play it that way because there are some people who believe that 
you should have to play vanilla stalker to earn the right to play the modded version and those people are mean um <laughs> and should not be listened to like st the best stalker experience is going to be modding the stalker games into whatever you want them to be okay they are frameworks they are not finished titles and that's available now for PC, PS4, and Xbox. And then a couple more announcements. Uh, they made an announcement for Persona 3 Reload DLC. There's an expansion pass now coming in three different waves, and it all finishes by September 2024. But they're not adding the female main protagonist, so yeah. fuck them. That's weird. The other thing, too, is that he they He gave said, some excuse as to why they, it was too much work or something, and it's just like, oh, That makes no sense. The whole reason anyone wanted a pers big Persona 3 remake was to have all the Persona 3 content in one package, yeah. and that's partly her. Well, like, they also said it's that really they dumb. They said they weren't planning on doing any DLC at all. And yeah. then the game sold like gangbusters and did huge on Game Pass, yeah. and they're like, oh, we're going to do it now. Because Atlas is fastest-selling game of that franchise ever. Which is crazy to me. So maybe you should take the extra time and effort and put the frickin'... Yeah. female protagonist <laughs> like make it in parody with a playstation portable one like that's what people wanted they it wanted to, to me they wanted to be able to have that and the portable one and the answer and fez all in one package yeah that's the complete persona 3 experience yep deliver it yeah uh so anyway that again that all that dlc is wrapping up before september 2024 it'll all be done and then they showed a Tales of Kenzera Zhao, which is right. on Matt's fantasy team, mm -hmm. side-scrolling 2D Metroidvania action game uh, with some interesting cultural angles to it. Mm -hmm. We've been championing that game since we first saw it, um, and they did show it in this big event, which was great. It's good yep. to see it get some face time for an event like this. Any, anytime you want to make games based on mythology other than Norse, Greek, Roman, and <laughs> Japan, go for it. Because yeah, those I mean, are all overdone at this point. Um, and that's it. That is the Xbox Partner Preview for March 2024. What's your letter grade for it, Matt? Since I barely remember it, I'm going to say C-. minus. Yeah. I, I'm i struggling with the grade for this because I'm really wondering if, like, this is as good as it's going to get for this type of stuff for 2024. I think more it's as good as it's going to get this time of year for it. That could we'll be. We'll see more in June. Yeah. Um, so back half of the year is going to be stronger, I think. I'm a little surprised Xbox did this with these It games. does seem to be... Like I, there's Hasty. nothing, there's nothing in this that would make me say like, we gotta tell the people, right? About, you know, because we need it, to do an event. Because none of for it this. seems to be like you know, very little of it is like immediately coming out. Yeah. It's like, do I need to know what Unknown Nine is right freaking now? No. Well, these were games that normally would be tacked on to the end of an Xbox thing, mm -hmm. where it's like, here's the last few games you might want to check out, like after they show like the big blockbusters. But I just feel like 2024 just might be that way yeah. for across the board. So we'll see. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, but we'll see. I don't think you are for the first half of the year. But I would give this... I'm right there with you. C minus C. Best case scenario. Like, there's just... There's nothing... You you couldn't remember a single damn game from it. No. <laughs> yeah, I remember when the B-roll hit. Right. Like, All right, that. I mean, yeah. it just, I mean that was like... A, but nothing was stuck. A, almost a full week ago. It was, a, it was forever. <laughs> but it's just... No, it just left my brain the instant yeah, yeah. I saw it. Yep. So there you go. That's the Xbox Partner Preview for March 2024. Next up. We're going to talk about a game people have been flummoxed by ever since it was first announced, including us, and that is Princess Peach Showtime for the Switch, also on Matt's fantasy team, I would add. Yeah. Um, we really, we saw... I think the, made a bet on this one. Yeah. Let's see. We, uh, well, I think you may be encouraged by what I'm about to say. Mm -hmm. um, so we were confused. We, we saw it was like, it's just a 2D platformer? Is it a metroidvania it would show these weird flourishes of her using like a ribbon and almost like magic but then it would show her like running sideways and attacking people with swords they're like what in the hell is this game well there is a demo of this game right now on the switch eShop, um and you guys can all go and download it and play it if you want to but that's what i've played i'm going to share with you what's in that demo right now and matt the first thing i will say is that this game is equal parts WTF and oh I get it mm -hmm. so basically the plot of the game Princess Peach finds a flyer to this theater in the theater you can see you're seeing it right now the bureau has a bunch of different plays all going at once she and her toadstool crew go to the theater to only to find out because <laughs> Mario doesn't do that shit <laughs> right? Mario's too busy playing 4,000 sports well one thing I will say about this is that like her last game and if you a lot of offshoots from Nintendo a lot of times the objective is to save Mario. If mm -hmm. Mario's not in the game, he's the person that you're saving a lot of times. Princess Peach's last game was like that. She was saving Mario. In this, 
That is not the objective of the game at all. It's just a disastrous night out. <laughs> it is kind of, actually. So Peach and the Toads go to this theater. She gets there. She finds out that this dude called Grape and his minions called the Sour Bunch, literally Grape and the Sour Bunch, have taken over the theater. And they've turned... A, all the theater's productions are supposed to be lighthearted comedies. And instead, Grape and his crew have turned them all into tragedies. Yeah, theater kids. Pretty... I mean, I'll, seriously though, this it looks it looks like a um, an enemy from a knight's game. Yep, Matt, this game was definitely made by at least one hardcore drama kid, because mm-hmm. it is just loaded with little details. And if you've ever worked in plays or musicals, it will make you smile. Oh yeah, I mean, I mean grapes already you know hitting all the notes. I mean, you, you give a theater kid. <laughs> A, a weird hat in the center stage and you're halfway home. All but right. they carry this aesthetic all the way through the game. So there's basically the game is you get there and it's your job to go into all these plays and turn them back into friendly, lighthearted productions instead of being these dour, depressing things mm. that Grape has turned so them into. So basically you're a Broadway producer. You are kind of, <laughs> yes. You are you're adding the cheer on top of this, this stuff. This is too edgy. We stopped doing this shit after <laughs> Angels in America won the Tony. Stop it. So you're basically each... So right now you're seeing you're in this little hub world. It's a lot like Super Mario 64, mm-hmm. honestly. I believe that's called a lobby. Yeah. <laughs> for, for once, very accurately called a it lobby. It is a lobby, yeah. And so there's doorways off of the main hub, and you just go into those doorways, and that takes you into each one of the plays. What kind of crazy-ass theater has this many stages? Well, it's not just the stages. Eventually you unlock another floor, and then there's more mm-hmm. stages on that floor. And basically you go into each one of these, and... Peach will have a transformation for each play. Mm. Um, she has... I didn't count them. It's better not turn out to be a dream. I don't think so. So I didn't count how many, but these are the different transformations she has. She can be a ninja, a figure skater, a pastry chef, a cowgirl, a mermaid, a detective, a thief, a kung fu martial artist, and then she can be a superhero called Mighty Peach. And so... You go into these plays, and you're trying to transform them back. So not only does she have the special abilities of whatever transformation she has for that stage, she also has her magical ribbon. So the ribbon turns things from dark back to light, basically. And you use it for a number of things, like reviving um, like these guys, reviving these guys so that they will then do something for you. It's used in a puzzle-solving capacity. But the ribbon is the thing that you have in every play. But it's not one of these games, Matt, where, okay, the first play, you become Zoro, basically. It's like sword hacking Peach or whatever. Mm. You finish that, and you bring that play back to light, literally back to light. And then you go back to the hub, and there's a little cinematic that shows the next door lighting up. And now you can go into this other play. Well, it's not like you go to that next play, and then you can use the sword fighting that you learned in the prior one, plus the new one that you just learned for that one every play you can just use the one power up Mm. so the game doesn't build on itself like most you have to choose what you're using you don't choose or just whatever it just tells you in this one you're gonna be ninja peach in this one you're gonna be the pastry chef like and you can't use anything else so it's not like most games where it's like hey here's how you use the sword combat now here's how you hear the pastry chef and now the third one is like you're you can use sword combat you can use the pastry stuff and a new one that's not how it works you have the ribbon in each one and one ability basically playing this game matt requires two buttons there's a jump button and there's an action button and that's it so when you are and you'll see eventually being sword peach or whatever it's just one button you just keep jamming the same button and she automatically does combos Um, And that's the way the whole game plays. You have a jump button, and you have the action button. And that's pretty much it. Eventually, there are context-sensitive things where you have to hit, like, Z left and Z right while she's standing in place. But otherwise, it is a two-button game. Now, they do try to get a little bit more out of it. So some of the boss fights, they'll slam the ground, and it'll send, like, a wave of energy out. If you jump over that wave of energy... It almost acts as like a counter kill. She'll do. She'll go into slow motion and do this like flip, and then land right on the boss and start attacking the boss. And you just jam that same action button you've been jamming and throughout the rest of the game. And that's kind of how the game plays. Um, it's very very simple. It's obviously made for younger players. Now, 
they do a couple things with it that may appeal to older players. So, for example, you find these gems in each level. There's 10 or 12 of them in each level. And, you know, a part, there's the first one, a sparkle gem. So there's 12 in each part, 10 in each play. And as you go through the level, like some of them are hidden, like in weird ways. Like you have to like use the ribbon on this thing that's over in the corner and one will pop out or something like that. Um, and so you collect those. And obviously if you're a completionist, you finish the level, it shows you how many you collected. And sometimes you have no clue how you missed like a couple of the gems. So there is some incentive to go back and kind of poke around in each level to try to find out how to get all the hidden gems. There's also um, these things called, they're like little bows that you can find. And you have to do very specific things to enemies to get the bow to pop out of an enemy and collect the bow. Um, and then there's a big element for customization and outfits um, where you just basically get different patterns for Peach's dress. Um, what else? That's pretty much it. <laughs> like, you just repeat the process over and over. You complete one of the plays, you go back to the hub, another door unlocks, you go into that door, you complete that one, you come back, rinse and repeat until you've made it all the way through all the floors on that level, and then a new level opens up with a bunch of new plays for you to do the same thing with. And that's pretty much the game. Now, what makes the game fun and exciting are the transformations. Some of them are handled so well um, like the figure skating one. Like I was blown away by how well the figure skating like looked. Like I didn't get to play it. I've just watched some trailers of it because it, it's not in the demo. But like the animation in this game is pretty freaking sick, man. Like the work that they've put into it. And again, the little touches. Like um, eventually, like there's some stealth levels in this game. And like if you go into the grass, Peach will hold up like these fake things of grass in front of her face. Again, if you've worked in musicals or plays, stuff like that, you're like, oh, I get it. And nobody notices her because they're all in the play as well. Like, it's it, the funny part is like, even the enemies are in on the bit. Like, if they just, it's maybe it's niche to make a whole game around something like this, but the theater kids are gonna love this game, man. Like, again, I've worked in musicals. I was in musicals growing up. Um, I even was on crew for, like, a musical of adults at one point in my life. Um, and I was just, like, pushing the sets out and things like that. Like, tangentially, I've been a part of this scene, and it even resonated with me on a bunch of different levels. Now, what concerns me the most about this is each one of these plays, you can literally finish them in, like, 10 minutes. Like, they're really easy. They're really simple. It's never hard to figure out what the game is trying to ask you to do. And so I'm starting to do the math here, and I'm like, if it takes me 10 or 15 minutes to finish each one of these, and the first floor, there's like eight of them, I'm like, okay, that's an hour and a half. Like, how many floors are there going to be with new, I don't know, I, I'm saying, looking at this game, this game probably is going to take a few hours to complete, would be my mm -hmm. guess. And then, do you want to go back into each play and find the missing gems or the bow that you missed or whatever? It'd be very funny if it was like the Mario games and like the post game is just hard, hard as nails. <laughs> <so> like, <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Everything I played in it was One easy. One hit deaths. Yeah. Like, no, like, yeah. But the, again, the variety is all over the map. Like, you never do the same thing for very long. Again, you go into one of these stages, you're only in it for, like, 10 minutes. And then you go on to the next one where you do something else. And, like, sure, you know, this this stage where you play as Zoro Peach or whatever, it's very simple. You hit mash the same button to do the sword combos, and you just kind of mash your way to the end. Right about the time you start to get sick of it, it ends. And you go on to the next one. And each one of them is completely different. So the ninja... Peach is like the stealth. I was talking earlier about like sneaking through the grass. You hold up like the little grass things in front of your face, which is pretty clever. There's another section of the game where you're underwater and you use like a little reed to come up and poke up out of the water so you can breathe in the water. And it looks amazing. Like the, again, the animation and the detail and the graphics in this game really shocked me because they haven't even, they've been like cagey about who's developing this game. I think they finally may have figured it out, but Nintendo won't announce like exactly who's developed this game for some reason, but they've done a pretty good job on it. Now I'll say this, the engine isn't great. It does chug at times, which I thought was pretty crazy. I mean, it's Unreal Engine. Is it Unreal Engine? It's Unreal 4. Is it? Yeah. How did you know that? I read something about it before, and then Vincent just said it uh, in the chat as well, but I knew that. I, def I don't remember why I know that, but I do know that. Yeah, it does slow down every once in a while, which is a little odd. Um... So anyway, it's the, it's the switch. So yeah, 
So anyway, Ninja is like stealth. The figure skater is literally just figure skating on ice, and you have to like complete like like skating patterns on the ice. Um, Kung Fu is basically just martial arts, so that's hand to hand combat. The superhero Mighty Peach is she's just like super strong and can, and can pick up things that are really heavy. Um, the pastry chef one is probably the biggest outlier because it it becomes almost like a mini game collection. It's almost like Mario Party, mm-hmm. where you're creating literally creating desserts. You're icing desserts. You're uh, you're mixing things in a bowl and creating like these pastries. That you have to then load onto carts that take them out. Um, it's stuff like that. Then there's a cowgirl, Peach, and that plays like the old Atari 2600 game Stampede. Do you remember that? Yeah. Where you're on a horse and you're trying to get the cows before they go, they run past you. That's how cowgirl Peach plays. She had a, like a Godfather Mafia section where she became Cup Peach. <laughs> that would be great. They don't really, the one thing I will say about this game, they don't, there's not a lot of like inside jokes for adults in this. They keep it pretty young, pretty much across the board. There aren't many nods for like the parents that might want to play this with their kids. Uh, there's Mermaid Peach, and that's self-explanatory. It lets her swim underwater. There's Detective Peach, where she creeps around with a the flashlight. Um, there's Dashing. There's the Dashing Thief, and she becomes almost like Robin Hood in that one, um, where she can her traversal is really good. She can like wall climb and wall run and things like that. Um, what else is there? Uh, Detective Thief, and that's it. So yeah, those are all the different transformations that she has. Uh, but again, as you watch this footage right here, like I'm just tapping the same button the whole time. There's no other button. I'm jumping and I'm hitting the attack button. And that's pretty much it. And as you may have seen a little earlier there, um, you'll you'll see this guy requires you to do the jump parry basically in order to open him up to finally attack him. But again, it's just two buttons. And what I finally figured out is like, oh, I have to jump just as he's attacking and she'll do her little counter kill thing, jump over him as like a ghost and that right there and now he's open to attack so again it's a very very simple game this is definitely made for the young kids out there um i don't know i mean i did, here's the thing matt like i did have fun with this because again i do have a history of working in like musical and play productions and so it uh it resonated me with me on that level i just wonder if it's going to do that for anybody else other than people like us who have worked in this space before because a lot of people I don't think will notice a lot of the things that I noticed and be like, oh, that's really cool. That's really clever. Um, there's a lot of pomp and circumstance in this where she just does her little flourish. Like, it is a very stylish game that is fun to play. It's like, it's hard for me to put my finger on why I enjoy playing this. It really is. Like, I am very curious to see how this game does with critics and how it ultimately does with, like, fans and sales. Like, I feel like this game could end up being like an 8.5 or like a five Mm -hmm. because I feel like some people may just be like, it's one button and that's it. And it's way too easy. But some people are going to be like me and be like, yes, one button, but they they're pretty clever with what they do with that one button. And if you understand what it's like to work on plays or musicals, it's kind of brilliant, honestly, some of the stuff that they do in the game. So it's, I think it's going to be polarizing. I think it's going to be, Really interesting to see how this game is received. It is coming later this month. It's just a couple weeks away. We will review this game on Game Face because I only got to play two of the plays in the demo. And again, there is a free demo on the eShop right now. I'm going to jump ahead to show you. You've seen enough of this. Well, here's a boss fight. And there are boss fights. But you can see, you jump over the wave. It allows you to jump on his head and just keep mashing that action button. And that's even all the boss fights are that simple and that easy. But you can see there, I got nine out of the ten gems. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, damn it, where's that other gem? I had no idea where that other gem was. And I the king w- trapped in the castle. Was it? Yeah. Oh, I didn't see it. The guys didn't have glowing noses. You had to hit them, hit them and they would have oh. freed them from the castle. Interesting. Um, so anyway, and I missed the bow there. You can see I didn't get the bow on this level. The next level, I do find the bow. But see, you finish this, and then you get the little cinematic back in the hub world. It goes over. It unlocks a new door. Then you can go into that door and play that one. And the second one is the Pastry Chef, which I found to be an interesting choice for this demo that they chose sword fighting and then this, where there's like this mini game that you play. Let me just go back a little bit here so you can see the first mini game. Um, 
So there's a mini game that you play where you're like baking the cake, you're mixing up the ingredients, and then the second mini game that you play is you icing the cakes. Um, and that character is sure to become a sensation with Nintendo fans, I'm sure. They're probably already trying to figure out where they can buy the plushie of Peach's little sidekick. Um, but anyway, here's Peach, the pastry chef. And again, it's just like a little mini game collection that you play. And there's only two mini games, and it finishes. So again, most of these plays you can finish in like 10 minutes. And then it's, you go back to the hub, another door opens up, you go into the next play, you play that for 10 or 15 minutes, rinse and repeat until you get to the end of the game. And again, it has me nervous that this game may not be all that long. That could potentially hurt its scores as well. Um, I checked to see what this is selling for. Um, but again, I have not played a game like this, Matt, maybe ever. <laughs> it's really hard to find games like this anymore for me. Like something where I'm like, man, like for example, Matt, like she, notice how the swing just comes out from like nowhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, it's related to like working in production with plays. There's just little stuff like that throughout the entire game. Um, but again, a lot of the flourishes afterwards, like it's, there's just, there's a specific tone about this game. Also very cool, by the way, this shot right here, those cakes in that shot are the cakes I decorated. So you can even see the cakes that I screwed up, the screw ups are on those cakes. That top left, look, it's not finished. Like it's missing like one of the ribbons because yeah. I screwed it up. Like there's just, if you really pay attention to this game, there's stuff like that all through it where you're just like, wow, like the attention to detail is amazing, but I'm going to finish this game in like an hour. <laughs> like, So it'll be interesting to see what the reception to this game is. Um, they got the tone right. And I'm cool with like how they've treated Peach as a character. She's not like the damsel in distress. She's an ass kicker in this. She's the leader. She's the one everyone's looking to, to save the day. Like we need more of that type of stuff in the industry where female characters are the heroes and the real heroes and not the damsels in distress just waiting for some male character to come and save them. So um, I like the messaging in this game. I enjoyed my time with it. I don't know if I play, as you can see here, all the transformations in the game. I don't know if as I play more of those, if I'll like it as much, but I did have a lot of fun with it. And again, this demo is available for all of you to play right now on the Switch eShop. Um, let's see what you guys are saying about this. Check in with you guys as we always do after we discuss a game. Uh, let's see. Oh, first live show from Meteor316. Welcome, man. Glad you can make it. We're here every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, Vincent says, oh, he's talking about the Xbox show still. Um, can you tell Matt to play Unicorn Overlord ASAP? Well, we will be talking about Unicorn Overlord here in just too, a few too, minutes, Lestevid. Too late. <laughs> yep, he already has played it. We're going to discuss it here shortly. Um, Vincent says, yeah, that was annoying. I was just tanking the shockwaves on the boss since the game was generous on the hearts, and it wasn't clear that would progress the fight. Oh, another thing I should mention, too, is that, like, you eventually do get, like, little, like, buffs or whatever. Like, I had a buff that gave her an extra three health hearts or whatever. And I got that just in the demo. So I don't know what more other stuff you'll be getting as the game wears on, but I did earn that just in the demo. Uh, Vincent follows up. He says, this reminds me more of a Kirby game focused on collectibles, variety, and gameplay extremely easy. Yeah, I guess a little bit. And they don't have a Kirby game this spring. That's so. right. And usually it's Kirby game. Kirby, Kirby game. Kirby, Kirby game. <laughs> We're waiting Kirby for that game. next wave. <laughs> the Big Smoke says, it reminds me a bit of Luigi's Mansion 3. Uh, in terms of image quality yeah, yeah. i can see that um and a kind of a room by room design i can mm -hmm. kind of understand that as well as kind of a little bit of like a modular design game where it's just kind of all these parts that are snapped together with a hub my uh, legacy says reminds me of puppeteer a little bit yep uh, the abram says what's the name of that ps3 side scroller game with a theater theme oh what is that puppeteer Puppet oh it is puppeteer yeah that's, yeah. that's it yeah and Minority Games says, buying this for my eight-year-old niece. Don't just buy it for the niece. Like, that's what I'm trying to get at here. Like, I, I feel like the nephews will probably like this game, too. Like, mm -hmm. she's not this, like, helpless heroine. Like, she's an ass kicker in this game. Like, I totally think guys will resonate with this as well. Your, your nephews, your sons, things like that. Um, so anyway, that's Princess Peach Showtime is coming here in like a week and a half. It is a Switch exclusive, obviously. And once we get our hands on the final game, we'll discuss it far more in depth than we did here today. Just wanted to get it on your radar and also get that demo on your radar because you can go download it right now and play the game. Next up. Asking you shall receive, list, Ed. We're going to discuss Unicorn Overlord. Matt, this game 
has been getting sky high review mm-hmm. scores. Like it's, I think it's Metacritic is almost a nine right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I talked about it already. I had played a nice little chunk of it. Was it two weeks ago? I guess for Game Face. I think so. A couple weeks ago, and I discussed it. I have not had a chance to play more of it. The good news is that Matt jumped in and started playing it, and has played a little bit further than I have. Um, and so I'm going to lean on you mostly in this discussion, Matt, because I've kind of already mm-hmm. shared my thoughts on what I have played of it. Now that you've put your hands on it, what do you think? I mean, I think, um, I mean, the, the the pedigree is very clear from Vanillaware. Um, the art style is all there. Uh, one thing I will say is, um, like, I think a lot of the Dragon Force like parallels or that were, you made when I talked correct. about it. Yeah, they, they're they're there. The one thing that I think, the one thing that holds me back from like really singing his praises is um, the fact that all the strategy is in setting up behaviors before fights. Before you know, you set the it's almost behaviors. like adjusting their AI in some yeah. ways. I, I mean, uh, someone who played a lot of Final Fantasy XII, like I would call it gambits. Mm-hmm. It's like the gambit system. Yeah, like you, you're going to do this move, do it to this enemy because it's the, you know whatever that. One thing I did learn very early: uh, a lot of them come default with like attack the lowest percentage hit point enemy. No, you want them to attack the lowest hit point enemy. Because yeah. like, lowest percentage could mean you're attacking the guy with 95 out of 100 hit points instead of 100, and they'll all just you'll all just sort of whittle everybody down slowly, but you won't kill anybody. Which is the key in these games. You want to eliminate enemies. Yeah, because otherwise, because every round they get an attack. They, Every round they get an attack, and in the next round they'll get their health back. Right. Well, that's so, right. In this one, yeah. yeah. So you want to be if you eliminate an enemy, they don't come back when you attack that unit again. If you don't kill them, they get their health back. Yeah. Um. You don't, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. So the one thing I would say is, um, I wish there was a little bit of input available for kind of audibles in 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 the fight because we should remind you guys and i discussed this when i talked about it a couple weeks ago is that once you go into combat the combat just happens automatically yeah. you have no control over what's going on and see it's do, all about pre-planning and you do get to see like how much life they'll lose and how much life you'll lose mm-hmm. like you you it's all predetermined like they're rolling the dice before you even do yeah, the you, combat they, the game knows who's gonna yeah. win each skirmish before it happens so you can skip the combat animations without any downside yeah um and i do that with the overworld enemies mm-hmm. that just kind of hit you, you know, just harass you the whole time because yeah. as long as you as long as like in the overworld if you get a random battle as long as you do more damage than they do to you you win and you get all your life back yeah so it doesn't matter mm-hmm. they're just there to, to basically irritate you um but uh i wish because in dragon force when you're in the fight it's mostly automated but you you can choose formation you can choose you know stop pull back go forward charge and everybody just goes all out you can tell your leader to like do their special move and things like that. A little bit of that like, kind of makes you feel engaged. This doesn't really have that. I mm-hmm. wish there was a little more of a split between pre-battle planning and in-battle adjustment because that is part of battle strategy is being able to react on the fly. And there's a little, It's just little things where, like, so you've got you know, one of your beginning units, the girl, Chloe, casts heal. Mm-hmm. By default, she's set to heal the main Lex, who's the main character's best friend, sort of, at all times if he's damaged at all yeah but she does it to the detriment of herself so like there's times when like he had lost like two hit points in the fight and she'd lost 20 and was down to, like she five, heals him and instead she of heals herself. him at yeah. the end of the battle yeah. so i'm like no lady take care of yourself before you take care of others <laughs> yeah first aid rule number one you yeah know, you get, um and you can tweak that but it's like there's moments where you're like oh you idiot like you should just be, know that or i would be able to tell you that you know um, it's not so bad at first because the game does do a good job of like yeah it explains everything but once you've got like a it's just pretty easy big, at first. once you got like five or six units running around and you're trying to remember who's in what and then you get to a new battle and you're like oh no these guys should be together over here and it's a it, you sometimes you'll find yourself wanting to reboot restart a battle because you realize it would be better if these units were together and then I could kind of run through these guys and then yep. I brings this guy around and this this unit will be able to take out the archers in the tower while these guys walk through and don't even care because if there's archers around, they can, like, range to support you. So, like, you know, which isn't always factored into the uh, the, the life you'll lose. So if there's, a, if there's an archer in range and you have a fight, your, archer, your archers and their archers can contribute, a, like, a volley at the beginning of the fight. And I've had that kill on, kill on my people before, and mm-hmm. that completely changes how much life is going to be exchanged, basically. Um, otherwise, it's very accurate. Um, it's not that big of a deal. It's just sort of like there's moments where I'm like, I could see this have been a little more involved. The, the closest, I mean, I know like the, the, because of the setting, 
the the natural comparison you're going to want to draw is Fire Emblem. Yep. But the actual comparison is Advance Wars. Yeah, no, you're right. Because Advance Wars is very much about types versus types. This beats that. Rock beats scissors. And once you attack someone in Advance Wars, you do not have control over what happens. They yeah, just you're exchange, right. It just happens. They exchange yeah. their stuff, and that's whatever happens, happens. Yeah. That is basically what happens here, except that a lot more stuff is being there's, exchanged. There's way more pre-planning in oh, this yeah. than Advance Wars. And everybody, basically the way it works is everybody's got, uh, you'll see on the little the little uh, uh, names and the moves there, there's a little diamond, like a little gem. That's a that's a, an AP, basically. And you can see them next to their life bars in the lower corner. Everybody uses up their AP back and forth based on their speed across the whole round. And basically, if you do more damage than they do to you, you win. Yeah. If you win, if whoever wins, if you don't kill everyone on the other side, you boot that unit kind of away from you, and they're sort of stunned for. It a like second. knocks them down. And if or you whatever. Get, yeah, and if you can get to them before they're unstunned, you get first strike. But what happens though is a lot of times their units will come in and like intercept you before you can get to the unit and finish them off. Which is an important tactic that you use as well. Yeah. You want to keep your guys together because you can usually choose who fights. Yep. And you look through like who's going to do the most damage and who's going to take the most damage. And you generally, you know, if you have a good mix of units kind of working together, you'll be able to find one of your units will be able to handle whatever gets thrown at them. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have a little ability. So every time you do something uh, good or kill somebody or whatever, you get... Um, can't remember the name of it, but it's like Valor Points or something. They like are that. Valor Points. You yeah. can use they that have Valor abilities. Valor, yeah, because yeah, you can use that to, to deploy units. But once you're done deploying, and you, you can use Valor Points to use basically special abilities that can heal people, can bring people back from the dead. Uh, it can provoke people to only attack one particular unit. Um, it can do like a big arrow strike with the ranged units. Um, there's a lot of variety. You can oh, and there's a stamina thing where you'll see like a number next to their their unit on the over on the little map. And every time you do anything, like a, a fight or whatever, it drops by mm -hmm. one. If it drops to zero, the, that unit has to sit there defenseless and rest for like a an eternity. Oh basically. man, it's brutal. Um, like you it, really got to get caught that. out. You're screwed. Yeah, and you can. There are abilities that let you add give stamina back to. Yeah, which is very important. You really have to watch. Um, that's the, that's the one thing I learned in my time with this mm -hmm. game is watching the stamina is yeah. really important. Very important. And the other the other thing that the, my my biggest gripe about this game is that it has a time limit on the yeah. battles. Are, and it's very, they're very short. They like the, are, yeah. Because you can pause it all. You can make all the decisions while it's paused whenever you want. You can only unpause it when you want. So it's not like you only have that amount of time in real time to yeah. do it. But in, when you, once you unpause and everybody starts moving around and stuff, that time limit starts ticking down. And it's like two minutes. Like you got to... Con you gotta do all the objectives and and beat that final like fort or whatever it is in like early on it's like a minute thirty yeah like, it's, it's really, really short and I didn't realize that the first battle I played and like I just had guys chilling in their in castles reloading their hit points so I could go attack the final and it's like oh game over yeah like, you ran out so of just, time like, if you arbit if you just arbitrarily don't win the battle within two minutes you lose the whole game which is not how war works i found like, it hard to manage that honestly. like if you want to like do that for like specific battles that have like a time limit yeah. and in the meantime there sometimes battles will throw like new units that come out of nowhere to like hit your base yeah and you gotta bring you, there's an actual item that's specifically for teleporting units back to where you need them to be because you might be out of position but like you can't really leave units back in reserve to guard the original base because you lose that base usually that's the you lose the battle yeah. Because to get through the missions and the amount of time you need, you generally need to send everybody up. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, there's also commands for that. I should have mentioned it when I talked about it before, but you can batch command yeah. units, which is really real, important. Yeah, you can almost real-time strategy it. But yeah. What I found myself doing most of all was picking each unit and see, and you go to... In the, in the pause, you go to like click them attacking each unit that's a, the enemy and see who they can do the best against yeah. and sort of send them up in sort of a group to sort of work around that and hopefully nobody runs into something that kills them too quickly and it was hard for me to balance the um i guess the best way for me to put it, it was hard for me to balance sending my guys out so that we could i could finish the battle within the time limit without putting them out and getting their heads cut off mm -hmm. like is that's the to me the strategy of this game is managing that dynamic well, like that's always that's why i'm always checking who's going to do what against each unit yeah and then i will assign the unit that will do the best to attack it mm -hmm. and then i will try to sort of micromanage where how fast they're moving and because if they both get there at the same time doesn't matter i just pick the one that does better and right. they have the fight yeah but like the horse like the guy on the horse the the the, the paladin the, the paladin guy 
um, he moves much faster and than farther. Yeah. So if I set them all at the same time, he just runs off. And you, I mean, he's super powerful. He's sort of that. He's sort of the veteran unit that you always get in a fire emblem game early yeah. on. That like sort of lets you carries run, run you for rough, the first fourteen you for a while, hours. and then he gets killed <laughs> off. I mean, he hasn't gotten killed off in my game yet, but I, yeah. his, it's coming. He's got to die. Yeah. Right? He's, he's too strong. Yeah. Um, and I'll put like the weaker units in his in his team, so like mm-hmm. they still level up because yeah, I can just, they like, get some juice from it. Yeah. Because yeah. that way, it doesn't feel like I'm wasting the XP by having him yeah. fight things. Because sometimes I just need to use him to soften up a fortress or something. Yeah, for sure. First. I mean, I've had him just go in on his own and oh, just yeah. take out a whole town. <laughs> oh yeah, and he you, just one hits everybody. And I knew the um the when, when we hit the difficulty curve when like I had a fight and he almost died. Yeah, like, he got knocked down by like thirty points. Yeah, and I was like, oh, oh okay. okay. <laughs> There's a spike. All of a sudden, the the, the unit types matter against him. I yeah. see. It, it does have a really. Nice, I will say, um, like the time limit's annoying. I yeah. wish it didn't have the Pikmin style time limit. I wish the time limit was only there for for battles that narratively made sense why you time. had to do them in a certain amount of time because if you just, I'm, I'm just like liberating a bunch right. of like they're about to bandits. flank me yeah i have a minute before i get flanked like right, exactly. set it up narratively yeah. like, uh, uh, just having an arbitrary time loan everything is annoying it doesn't make sense um, within the context it, does, of the it doesn't game. make it more fun yeah to me it, I makes, agree. it makes it irritating yeah. um but other than the other than that other than like feeling like i kind of have a lack of input on the, the combat outside of you know pre pre-planning and the time limit uh, this game's phenomenal. Yeah, you gotta fit. It's you gotta so fit good. it with the formations a little more than I would like as well. Yeah, but. the formations are important. Like, they're, they're, like none of the none of the unit stuff is trivial. Yeah, it's like you you gotta know who, who you're sending in and what the what the unit types do against each other. Now, to be clear, uh, they offer like kind of practice battles with every unit type just sitting around the overworld map Mm -hmm. uh you can go into any fort and do a mock battle with your units against each other and see how they go against each other Mm -hmm. like there's a lot of room to experiment and see how that works there's there's items that will level guys you can go after a certain point you can go hire mercenaries uh and the types of they all their classes they're obviously your 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 characters your named characters have specific classes but once you get them you can go hire that class from various places like i unlocked the character who's a cleric Finally, I can heal everybody. Mm-hmm. But, like, I can go hire a cleric who is not that main character again. Yeah. And you can kind of mix them in. And I've done that. And you can, you can choose. It, uh, this is one thing it has over Fire Emblem, I think. Is you go in and you can choose all the details of that mercenary you're hiring. And to be clear, it's not like a mercenary, like, you're hiring for, for a moment and it's going away. That's a permanent member of your team. Yeah, yeah. Um, you get to choose their name. There's a huge list of names they can be. You get to choose their voice. You choose the color of their armor, the highlight color of their armor, um, and then their growth type. You have two types of growth types you can pick. So you can, whatever your class is you're picking, you can then choose whether they're going to grow in an offensive way or a defensive way or an all-around way or the focus on magic or a focus on speed or a focus on evasion. So if you need, I'm like, I need, uh, like, I need, like, a, a, I can't even remember the names of the, the classes, really, but if I need, like, a, the guy with a big shield. Mm-hmm. And I want him to really be good at that. I want him to be the defense because the defensive skills, like they'll jump in front of you, yeah, your guys and block. Yeah, stuff they're proactive, so, yeah. and they'll take like one damage instead of like twenty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a big deal. Yeah, um, I want this guy to be the best. I want him to guard my main prince character. I want him to be the dude. You can just load him, not only load him up as that class, but you can like change his growth style so he's just gonna level up defense. Mm-hmm. And so within like five levels. He's going to be way better than like the named character of that class you yep. picked up. You can specialize that, yeah. way, which is really cool. Um, There's also eventually you have to you get to this point where you're like making food and you're yeah. ba- making sure all the places you've taken over have enough food yeah, you can and gather resources in the main in the overworld and bring them back to these towns. And if you bring enough back of that of these deliveries you make, the town will then like become functional again and yeah. you can post one of your characters as a guard which doesn't actually take them out of your party for some reason yeah it they, you just get bonuses for having <laughs> them assigned there but they're all there all the time yeah um you can fast travel using the boats if there's a port there mm-hmm. um and like and, and the the color of the land changes the whole right. tone and the music changes yeah, yeah. because you've liberated it yeah. like there's a real feeling of like pro- progress and accomplishment sure. as yep. you like liberate the i agree the uh the areas and once you get, I mean, there's like, there's a bunch of, con- like, I'm almost done with like the first continent, but there's like five more. Oh, like it's, it's a big game. It, it feels like it's going to be a big one. Yep. Um, and everybody, everyone you meet has a different story and all this drama and that, you know, you, you, you meet these guys. Oh, I know, inevitably, 
two battles after you pick somebody up, they're gonna run into somebody they know right. that happens to be because <laughs> like you're because you're like the the you're the Prince Elaine, and he's basically you know the the beginning of the game is your kingdom is is betrayed by this knight who used to be like a loyal warrior for your for the king and the queen and it turns it, out he's under a spell yeah or he's <laughs> just giving causing spell and he's like causing spells so he, yeah. he like put all your other knights under spells so you basically they were betrayed from the inside by a magically brainwashed crew like army yeah and your your mother the queen sort of holds them off and dies in the process probably or not who knows she might come back brainwashed later that seems like a pretty good <laughs> twist for this game right but he yeah. give, she gives you as a baby to or a child a young child to her knight the paladin here joseph yeah and he takes you to another continent and he raises you there's so like 10 years later you're like 18 and now it's time to go back to so ascend to the throne and, and, yeah. and, and like uh, i think a bunch of the bad guys show up on your your idyllic island and you have to fight them off and you're like yeah. well they know we're here we might as well yeah, go they back invade, to the mainland yeah. and just like and it's a very thinly disguised europe yeah. If you look at the map. Oh, yeah, yeah, for like sure. You're, 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 you grew up in England. <laughs> yeah. Little England up there. And you're going back to France to yeah. liberate this from the magic, evil magic brainwashing night guy. Yeah. And everybody's real happy to see you. Yeah. And it's like, it's very pleasant. And everybody talks like some sort of like Shakespeare Game of Thrones character. And it's like, it's like, verily, we must ask for thine help. Kind of, it's like, it's, and yeah. it kind of works. I think like, it works. Yeah. Like there's a density to the, to the character work that I think mostly comes across like, um, everybody feels like like they've got their own ideas. They're like you can tell who everybody is just from who's talking and what they're saying, which is like kind of rare in video games, especially like games like this, like this yeah. sort of strategy. Everybody kind of blends together, but you know who everybody. You, everybody has a distinct personality. At the point that like you you know who they are, and then like as you sort of like Fire Emblem, as you fight together and make decisions together, you get bonuses in the rapport. When it hits certain levels, a heart fills up, and you can have a separate conversation, like a story based conversation with them in certain places. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all there. It's all there. It's all yeah. there. Every kind of imagine, any any kind of like weapon you can buy, every kind of accessory you can trade around. Um, it's it, there's a lot. There's a lot in this game, and it's just the the music's great. The scale is there, and the scale deliver like the scale that you think it's going to work on is the scale it's working on. Yeah, like, yeah. That's the thing is like so many of these sort of like big JRPG things like give you this idea of this huge like war combat or you know like, like event happening, and you're sort of like yeah, but then like we're really just like, kind of like Final Fantasy sixteen. We're just going to run around this little map right into the, and like pick them. No, this thing's huge. No, like, it is. Yeah, and like the the overworld stuff is actually kind of actiony like you, you you have to like you can hide in the woods and like not the right. patrols yeah. will walk past you and you go around and get items it feels like you're not supposed to get to them yet yeah even though clearly you are but it's like it, but it feels good you yeah know? i agree and you like yeah. meet different characters and they sort of set up a little side quest and you're like okay if i do that i'll recruit the witch or i'll recruit the angel or whatever and you're like so you gotta split your time and like there's a point where you can do like one of two different routes and you can actually do both but i'll tell you know you can go all the way through and then go back and do the whole the other one I'm going to tell you to start both until you recruit the characters that are re relevant to each of those routes, because then you can use all those characters right. to go through to both go of those routes. Yeah, like, yeah. There's not. It's not. As far as I've seen so far, you can't really be locked out of content. Yeah, it doesn't feel that way. Yeah. Um, in matter of fact, even there's a big town at the very beginning where like it's a walled city, and it's like you come up to it, and it's like you are not ready for this. Yeah, come yeah. back in a few levels. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's it the center the of the. Pretty but well. it's the center of the whole map, and you can come at it from any direction, and you still get to have the same sort of. It doesn't make you go all the way back around or anything. It's it's uh, there's an elegance to it that I like. It's it's interesting. So as you know, I mentioned when I previewed it a few weeks ago that you know I didn't like the hands off combat, mm -hmm. but. It's, you're just swapping one for the other. Yeah. Instead of spending the time while the combat's happening, you're spending more time before the combat happens. I think your mileage is going to vary on that depending on what kind of a player you are. I would still prefer to have a little bit more control inside yeah, combat. Because but. you can't really change a lot of that in the battle. Mm -hmm. And I would argue... I mean, it does tell you like the, the units you're likely to face so you can kind yeah. of plan ahead. But I, I, I feel like the pre-battle recon is a little light on the ground. I agree. Yeah. Um, and so I would like a little more... I, again, I just want... Uh, I would like a little more ability to audible. Yeah. Even if it's not in the actual you know, fight, it was just on the ground. But you can still I set up a system for Audible. Say if this hap yeah. if X happens, then I want to do Y. Right. But it doesn't really. But sometimes you it. just don't even know you can do that until that until that happens, and you're like, well, next time I'll set that up. But also, a lot of times you you don't you can either have this this move fire off for this, 
or for this, and it's not both. Yeah. And you got to decide which one's more advantageous. Usually, I set I set almost everything and just attack the lowest HP enemy. Yeah. And that tends to get me through. Yeah, things it makes pretty sense easily. because you want to eliminate someone from the yeah. fight. The most intricate like stuff I've had, like equations I've had to set up have been the healing spells. Yeah. Like you like the game. Isn't smart enough. That, I mean, it is, but it's, it's like Chloe wanting to heal Lex makes sense because they have a relationship that works that way. Like, mm -hmm. she basically thinks he's an idiot and she right. has to take care of him. So yeah. the fact that she would prioritize him over her is in Narratively character. makes sense, yeah. But strategically, strategically I'm going to need you to like, take care of yourself yeah. first, kid. Yeah, I hear you. Because uh, she's in the back, and if she gets hit, she gets, you know, she's not as strong. Yeah, yeah. He can block stuff, and she can't. That's all. Yeah. So that's Unicorn Overlord. It's available for everything. How much actually was it? It's not on PC, unfortunately. It's not on PC. That's right. It's but it's on both PlayStations, both Xboxes, and Switch. Yeah, I want to say it was fifty. Fifty bucks. I can't remember. I, th I think do you so. recommend people buy it? Hundred percent. Maybe it was sixty. I can't remember. It's hundred percent. It's. I think it's great. Yeah. Um, especially if you're a Vanillaware fan, you know what you're getting into. It's got that same kind of. As a matter of fact, it's actually the closest comparison to a Vanillaware game is Grim Grimoire. Yeah. Like if you remember that mm -hmm. game where it was like a two D like haunted Absolutely house. Absolutely do. Yeah. It's that's the closest. That this isn't. This is a. This is the Grim Grimoire in the post like Fire Emblem Three Houses Game of Thrones world. Yeah, that's what they did. Here. Yeah, yep. And it it works. I enjoyed it. I don't see myself finishing the game. I can, I can see, see it's myself, really freaking long. I can like, see myself sort of continually coming, like keeping tabs on it as I go through the rest of the year. Yeah. But I, it's a it's a big game. It's yeah. a, you'll it's get a, your money if you like it. You'll definitely get your money's worth for yeah. sure. Yep. Okay, let's move on. We're gonna talk next about another event that happened this week, and this is going to be very short. It's for Capcom Highlights, Matt. Capcom did kind of like a little mini E3 thing where it had two days of presentations spread. Like, there's a couple days in between each one of them. Um, and it basically went through all of its games that are on the horizon. There was a couple notif notable omissions. We didn't see Pragmata, um, mm -hmm. which we haven't seen now for six or months or whatever. Who knows what's happening with that I mean, game? That's the one that we got an apology note for, right? That's the one with the spaceship, with the space dude with the little girl. Yeah, basically. And they, and they basically said, like, we don't even know. We screwed up. Yeah. yeah, basically. So that wasn't shown, but pretty much all of his other stuff that's coming up was. Um, we're not going to talk too much about Dragon's Dogma 2 because we're going to be talking about Dragon Do Dragon's Dogma 2 a lot here over the next like few weeks on Game Face. Um, but one thing that they did do is they released a demo for the game. But don't get too excited. It's not a playable demo. It's just a character creation tool. Mm. Now, saying that, it's pretty insane how people have been going off on the character yeah. creation tool. By the way, previews for Dragon's Dogma 2 this week were glowing. Like, Game of the Year candidate-style previews. So... Mm -hmm. Might want to earmark that one and start following it on Sifted right now because it looks like we got one coming in hot here with Dragon's Dogma 2. But we're going to talk about that a ton. Um, we're going to talk about some of the other stuff that Capcom showed. Um, the big highlight here is Kenitsu Gami Path of the Goddess. It is this strange game that we got a first look at probably like eight months ago. And we were like, what the hell is it? Well, now we know what it is. So it is basically a reverse tower defense game so instead of being the defender like you normally are in tower defense where you know lines of enemies come walking down the path and you set up units on the side of the path to take them out you're the ones coming down the path so your job basically the game is split into day and nighttime during the day you go and recruit villagers and the villagers are basically your units they all have different abilities some of them attack some of them defend some of them cast spells etc so during the day you go and collect all those guys and build your little army and then at night it's your job to escort the maiden from one side of the map to a gate and basically what you do is you set up your villagers along the path to take on enemies to protect the maiden now you are also along with the maiden you have a sword and you can use that to attack the enemies as well but for the most part you're setting up your villagers as your units along the pathway to take out enemies who are trying to stop the maiden from getting to the gate once you get to the gate you purify the gate this game is all about a world that's like covered in sludge and you're trying to purify the world basically so each mission you it's a new area you escort the maiden through the gauntlet, you help with the help of your villagers, you get to the end, you perform a ceremony at the gate, it unlocks the gate, it purifies that part of the world, rinse and repeat, and move on. I never would have dreamed that that's what this game was when I first saw it. There are also boss fights in the game, as you can see, lots of big creatures. Simply put, though, Matt, 
In 2024, it's really hard to find a game like this that is unlike anything else. It's really hard to for me to also fathom how game developers, and maybe there is a game out there that I'm just not aware of, that has done this, that reverses the concept of the tower defense game. I don't know. I can't think of any that have done it that way, and there are so many tower defense games out there. Um, but no one have really approached what this game is doing. Um, what do you think of it now that you've kind of heard what it really is? Uh, it sounds annoying. Like, it just Do sounds... you like tower defense? I actually don't know Not that. Really, I don't really. I, I, mean, have, I, don't I have, do like it. I don't really have an opinion. Yeah. I like a couple of them. But I, like... For a while there, I went through a phase where I was loving tower defense. I would play any game I could get my hands on. There was one I played for a while, but I can't remember the name of it, so that should tell you about <laughs> how much <laughs> tells, impact that Tells you all you need to know. Me. Yeah. Um... I don't know. Like it, it, it feels like it combines the annoying part of tower defense with the annoying part of character action games. <laughs> you may not be ideal for you. I can see that. Um, I do like, though, how it is split up into the two stages where the yeah. daytime's your prep and you get ready for the big battles. And then at nighttime, it all plays out. And you see if everything that you did and all the plans that you made and all the villagers that you recruited paid off, so to it speak. It is an interesting idea. It's just I don't, I don't, I don't think it's for me. Yeah. Um, and the units, they they're, they range exactly how you would guess. There's archers, there's magic casters, there's carpenters too. Uh, there's some sec things that you come al come across where there are these these apparatus that have been broken or busted, and you can use your carpenter to re carpenter to rebuild them, and that helps you fight against the creatures in the nighttime. Um, as I said, there are special attacks in the game. The elite character is named So S O H. Um, and eventually, the, the, he does he does get special attacks. You can always adjust the villager. Here's one thing I do like about this, too, is a lot of tower defense games, once you set it, they're set there. In this, you can adjust. So while everything's happening, you can go back and you'd be like, nope, I placed that unit there. It's not working. I'm going to move that unit from where he was over to this place where he can be more effective. So it does give you a little bit of wiggle room in how you can deploy your units and then adjust them as the match goes on, which kind of flies in the face of the way a lot of tower defense games have been designed in the past. So um, the enemies in this are called the Seethe, and then eventually you fight the Festering Seethe, which are basically the bosses. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much how the game works. It is coming to... I think it might be an Xbox console exclusive, Matt. I think it's great now. It's coming to like PC and both Xboxes and Game Pass. Or maybe they just, for this, they didn't share that it's coming to PlayStation. But I didn't see anything about it coming to PS5 in any of the stuff in Capcom highlights. So this game for me, Matt, went up on my radar. Like this was kind of something that's in the back of my mind. I'm like, what the hell is that game? Now that I know what it is, I'm excited for it. So I don't know if it's going to be a big seller. I don't think it's going to be Capcom's like next huge hit or whatever. I think it's way too Asian and Japanese for that. But I'm excited for it. And again, as someone who loves tower defense, I'm excited that this, this kind of turns this on its head and is looking at things from a completely different perspective. So again, this game is called, let me get it right, and I'll probably say it incorrectly anyway, um, it's called Kunitsugami Path of the Goddess. And again, it appears to be coming to PC and Xbox and Game Pass. It's also coming in 2024. They haven't given us a solid date for it, but it's coming this year at some point. So... Hopefully that's the case and it doesn't get delayed. Uh, the second biggest thing from Capcom Highlights was another DLC character for Street Fighter VI, and that is Akuma. Mm -hmm. Where does Akuma place on your pantheon of Street Fighter characters, Matt? A lot of people love him. Uh, I've never been somebody I use much. Yeah. Um, yeah he's all power and no life. Yeah. Usually, uh, usually has a smaller life bar than everybody else. Um, obviously Daigo. Used yep. him to great effect for a while. Mm -hmm. um, he's, I mean, he's gonna, he's got to be there. I'm not surprised he's one of the first. Yeah, I'm a little surprised he wasn't in it to begin with. Right, yeah, with the base roster. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little surprised too. But this will sell some DLC for Street Fighter Six. I guarantee. I see why they did it that way. But yeah. <laughs> it will, it will definitely move some DLC units for Capcom. I think. Um, but yeah, they didn't say exactly when he's coming. I think it's like May or something like that. Man's need a haircut for two games now. <laughs> um, but anyway, so that is the next DLC character for Street Fighter VI. And then just a couple other things that they showed. Um, they they showed 
Monster Hunter Stories 1 and 2. So we mm-hmm. talked about Monster Hunter Stories 1, which was a 3DS and mobile game that's now coming to consoles. They showed that again, and that's all happening. The big story for this one was Monster Hunter Stories 1 is now coming to PlayStation for the first time. Or no, I'm sorry, 2 is now coming mm-hmm. to PlayStation for the first time. It was a Switch exclusive before. Both of us enjoyed it a yeah. good bit. It's also on PC. That's right. It is on PC. And now it's coming to PlayStation 4. So Monster Hunter Stories 1... We talked about that already a couple weeks ago. Now 2 is coming to PlayStation 4. Um, and then they showed Exoprimal Season 4 DLC. There's like a Mega Man mashup happening there. If you guys remember, Exoprimal mm-hmm. is the cooperative dinosaur shooter from Capcom. Also did not end up becoming a hit. Yeah, somehow still going. Somehow still going. I mean, um, I guess they got to do at least a year, right? And I think they have, they're doing so many crossovers with other Capcom IP that they're like, okay, that'll get us out to a year. And if that isn't going to help the game, then nothing is. And they can just let it die. And my guess is that's what's going to happen. Um, and then the final thing was they celebrated the six-month anniversary of Monster Hunter Now, which is the mobile version of Monster Hunter. They didn't show anything from the new one, which is what Monster Hunter Rise. I kind of thought we might get a look at that, but they didn't show anything else. We still just have to Rise already out. Is, I thought Rise is the new one. I thought Rise was the one after World. There isn't one after World. World is the latest main No, that was, the, that was the, the Switch one. Oh, Rise is the Switch one. I think yeah. you're right. Yeah. Then it's on everything now. Yeah, that has then been ported to other ones. Yeah, what is the new one? Monster Hunter Animals or some crap? No. I can't remember what it is. I don't remember. They didn't show it, the though. The chat's not working. So. Yeah, they didn't uh, They didn't show it. Hey, what's up, the chat? knows. You gotta scroll. Oh. I didn't feel like I had stopped it. Wild. wild. Yeah, that's, that's what it is. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that was not A there. wild animal. I see where you're going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it was not there. Um, and honestly, there's, as I said, Pragmata wasn't there. So there's a few Capcom things that didn't make the cut. No new Resident Evil stuff was in any of this. Mm-hmm. And again, what we just talked about was spread across two things. Like, two th- day, yeah. that's hardly even enough for one event. But they spent one of them, almost the whole thing, literally... They did like a 30-minute demo of the character creator for Dragon's Dogma 2. Yeah, they know where their bread's buttered. I mean, it worked. You know, There's, if you look at social media, everyone's sharing their Somebody characters. Somebody made Pikachu in that. It's the most horrifying thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I can't even imagine. It's like a furry old man. Yeah. So anyway, that is Capcom Highlights 2024. That was their pre-E3 event. Um, but obviously leaving the door open for some bigger stuff. Uh, I see Vincent in the chat says that Monster Hunter Wilds is to be shown off in the summer, which would lead me to believe that that will probably be a part of Capcom's not E3 presentation for 2024. So anyway, that's the latest on all of Capcom's stuff. Um, and again, it was spread across two days. They probably could have done it in one. I don't think 30 or 40 minutes on a character creator was a good use of their time, but maybe it was looking at the response I mean, that's to their, it on social that's media. That's their anchor game this year. It is. And based upon the recent previews for it, it probably should be Capcom's anchor game. It's looking like it's rounding into form. Matt and I obviously have been fans of the first Dragon's Dogma for a really long time, and we're excited for it. So there you go. That's Capcom Highlights 2024. And with that, it's time to get on with our sneaker of the week from New York Sneaker Society. And before we get to that, though, here's a word from our sponsorship. What's up everyone, Shane here, and one thing you may not realize about me is that I am a total sneakerhead. That's right, I've been collecting Nike sneakers since the early 90s. My favorites are Air Max 95 and Air Max 97. Now, one thing that's different about me from your typical sneakerhead is that I actually wear the sneakers, and because of that, they can get dirty. And that is where New York Sneaker Society comes in. Using their advanced shoe cleaning products, I turned an old pair of Nikes that looked like this into this. With their cleaning products, your sneaker life can go from a year to five or more. I know that I have shoes that are like 30 years old that I still wear because I've cleaned them. You can also lower your carbon footprint, haha, by keeping your kicks looking fresh. For my daily drivers, I also appreciate New York Sneaker Society's Refresh Spray to keep them smelling great and staying crisp. Head to nysneakersociety.co slash sifted to clean your shoes like a pro at home and get 10% off your order. That's right, that's nysneakersociety.co slash sifted for 10% off. That's right, everyone. Go to nysneakersociety.co slash sifted to get yourself your own cleaning kit. Remember I had mentioned earlier in the show about how it's very important that if you're going to use 
our services that we're sponsored by that you use those URLs. So make sure again, you go to nysneakersociety.co slash sifted and get yourself a kit there. Now in the ad, it mentions that there's a 10% discount if you use that URL. New York Sneaker Society has just bumped that discount up to 15%. So again, if you use that URL, you'll get 15% off your cleaning kit. Now, I feel like I'm beating this drum every week. I'm trying to explain to you guys why there's value in this. You may have gone to their site. You're like, oh, little spendy to get that kit. But again, you're reviving shoes that are going to save you over $100 per pair. Now, I've mentioned before, if you've worn out the bottom of your soles, nothing you can do to fix that. Unless you want to use, there used to be, when I skated, there used to be this stuff in a tube called goo yeah. that yeah. was like basically liquid rubber and we put it on the side of our shoes that we ollied on and we just smear it on there and it get us through like another like few days you maybe you could do that to the mm. bottom of your shoes and get a little bit more time out of them for the most part if you've worn a hole through your shoes you can pitch those but i guarantee you have old shoes in your closet and you stop wearing because they started looking a little beat up maybe they looked a little dirty go get those shoes get yourself a kit in new york sneaker society and clean them and by the way, if you buy a kit, you have enough to clean like 20 pairs of shoes at least. You can re re rescue, revive all the shoes in your closet. Again, go to nysneakersociety.co slash sifted and get yourself a cleaning kit. I live by them. I have now revived almost every pair of shoes in my closet. Just got a couple more to go. And now my wife is trying to get in on it. She's like, oh, I have these old Air Max. And I'm like, I ain't doing it. You got to do it. So anyway... Again, make sure you use these URLs when you go to buy stuff. It makes a difference. It's how they track how the sponsorship is doing. And in the case of this one, it gets you a 15% discount. Um, and now it's time to talk about our sneaker of the week. And unfortunately, I've, I'm still having problems with this external hard drive, Matt. Stuff I'm transferring is still not transferring over to this hard drive. I'm going to have to just trash it and get a new one. So unfortunately for our live audience today, we do not have the trailer for the game that is our sneaker of the week. And by the way, our sneaker of the week is generally a game that's kind of flying under the radar that in a particular week has kind of crept up in our consciousness. And the game for this week is a game called Turbo Golf Racing. Have you heard of this game, Matt? Nope. It is Rocket League combined with golf. And I'll be honest with you, it's a little dirty because the cars in it look exactly like Rocket League cars. Um, but I think they've done that intentionally to draw that mental connection with players and people who watch the media for it. But the bottom line is, it's really freaking cool. Like you basically are like playing Rocket League on a gigantic golf course and you're using the car to hit the ball. It's very unique. And they put out a new trailer for it this week that showed off the... Uh, it's release date and obviously a bunch of gameplay and you guys loved it it was one of the most watched trailers on sifted this week and there were some bangers that came out this week but that game just really caught your attention and caught your eye and because you guys i saw the stats for it were watching it i was like i'm gonna check it out too and sure enough it's a really cool game so our sneaker of the week for episode 380 is turbo golf racing and a big thanks to new york sneaker society for an awesome sponsorship and with that, it's time to get to our last topic of Game Phase 380. We're going to talk about Contra Operation. They're pronouncing it Galaga, but I keep calling it Galuga. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what the right pronunciation of it is? Is it Galaga? Galaga would probably be more correct because Galuga would be a very feminine way of saying that word. Okay. Well, it is the first Contra game since 2019. So it's been almost five years since a, new, since a Contra game. And... This one is made by Way Forward. Way Forward is the studio that makes the Shantae games, which are great mm -hmm. friggin' Metroidvanias. Um, some of the best, honestly. They kind of fly under the radar, but they're really great games. And Way Forward has a pretty solid reputation. So I was pretty excited and, and encouraged when I heard that it was making this game, but then I played it. <laughs> I mean, there hasn't been a good Contra game since the Super Nintendo, really. It really has been that long. Well, the other thing that we should keep in mind here is that this is actually not a new Contra game. This is a loose remake of the first Contra. It has pretty much all the same stages as the first Contra. The plot is basically the same. There's little tweaks and changes here and there, but for the most part, it pretty, stays pretty true to the first game. The big difference in it is that you can unlock new characters that were not a part of the original game, and a ton of them. 
And here's the thing, that's important because those new characters are what make this game feel like a new game. If you play through it as just the two dudes, it feels like a much better looking, smoother playing Contra, the original Contra. Um, but otherwise, like, even if you look at the levels, like platform by platform, they're identical to the first game. There's eight stages in it. Again, just like the original game, the same eight stages. And I'll say this, the graphics, you're seeing them now in our B-roll, obviously, but the game looks way better. Like, I almost forgot what the original Contra looked like, so I went back and, like, checked out a couple of videos of it on YouTube or whatever, and I was like, wow, what an upgrade this game is visually. There's no denying that for sure. Um, and, look, I don't want to get the impression that the game is bad. I actually did have a, a nice little nostalgia trip playing this game. I had some fun playing it, for sure. Um, and the last one was Contra Rogue Corps. That was from 2019. This is way better than that. And I wouldn't say it's good enough to maybe revive the franchise for Konami, but it's close. Like, it's at least reached a level of proficiency now, which I wouldn't say that about before. There's two modes. There's a story mode and an arcade mode. And there's, like, a challenge mode, too. But that's just reusing the same levels over and over. The difference is, in the story mode, you get the story, obviously. And there's cutscenes. In the arcade mode, it cuts all that stuff out. And it just gives you X number of lives to get through the game with. In the story mode, you get three lives, and then there are checkpoints and continues. Now, I'll say this. Those checkpoints aren't not very nice. Like When you die in this game, you generally do have to go a good ways back, and then you get those three lives again. But what happens is they've designed the game pretty well so that that gauntlet you have to go through again, like if you get good at the game, you can make it through losing like one life or whatever. Like sometimes you have to go through a whole gauntlet and then fight a boss and hope that you still have some of your lives left once you get to that boss. So a lot of this game is kind of perfecting it. The thing is, it's so damn hard and insane that perfecting this game is almost impossible. It's like, you do get in the zone at a certain point. Like there was times playing this where I was like, wow, I can't believe I did that. Sometimes it was luck, but sometimes it was just me getting good enough at the game where I was able to accomplish things at it that I wasn't able to accomplish when I first started playing it. But it's just like the boss fights in this, they're just madness. It's like, the boss is slamming stuff on you, firing laser beams, and then there's just random, like, fireballs coming from the sides. Like, again, it's madness, and it, there is the sense of accomplishment you get in this game when you do manage to get through some of that stuff. It's pretty freaking awesome. Again, though, it basically completely replicates the plot from the first game. Um, Bill, Riser, and Lance Bean are going to the island of Galuga. Originally, they're going there because they're they think they're taking on this terrorist organization. What's it called? Red Flag or something like Red that? Red Falcon. Red Falcon. And then they realize that they've actually, Red Falcon, the terrorist organization, has turned into aliens. And in the first, like the original game, they don't bother trying to explain that. They're just like, that's just the way it is. They're supposed to be terrorists. They're actually aliens. Just kill them. Well, in this, they try to explain away how a terrorist organization turned into aliens. And it just becomes this insanely long-winded explanation that it just doesn't matter. You don't care. And so in this game, I was just constantly just fast-forwarding through all this just rungs and rungs of dialogue that nobody is ever going to care about. So I guess I, what I'm saying is I would probably recommend playing the arcade version of this. The other thing, too, is that the arcade version allows you to play four-player co-op where the story mode only allows two. Neither mode lets you play online with people, Matt. Mm. Which, to me, is the biggest deal-breaker of this game, period. That you cannot play it online with other people. It's just mind-boggling. I have Maybe it comes at a later update, but I don't think so, though. The other thing I would say, too, is that maybe the game stays a little bit too close to the original. You're seeing in the B-roll, you have all the same weapons. You have the homing, you have the laser, you have the flamethrower, you have the spread shot. You get all that stuff, and it's very nostalgic when you first get it. Um, but if eventually, like, there's probably not enough weapons. And the other thing about it, too, that I feel like they could have changed and made it better is, like, if you accidentally come across a power-up, you just automatically pick it up and lose whatever weapon you're using. So, like, I like to use the homing weapon because it's pretty powerful and it just locks in on enemies. Every once in a while, you'll just run across a power-up and it'll just pick up some gun that you don't want to use and you'll lose the homing shot. And sometimes the, the what's going on on screen is way too much and you're just like, I just got to keep moving Again, a part of the original Contra. No reason why you couldn't have fixed it here and made it a little more user-friendly, given it a little bit of a quality-of-life update. Um, 
But otherwise, like, I guess the best thing I would say is, like, it is very faithful to the original Contra. And I think that's to a fault. Like, I I liked Contra back when it came out in, what, 1983 or whenever it was? That would have been 86. Yeah, I guess it was 86. So 14, 38 years ago? <laughs> This was great then. It's 38 years later. Like I, I mean, think... I'm looking, this is very different from con- from the layout of Contra. You think so? There's no there's no hanging from stuff in Contra. Is in there... the original one, yeah. yeah. Are there 3D? Are the... Eventually there were, though, are in the... Contra. In the, uh, once Treasure started doing it, yeah. Yeah. Are there, th- are there the 3D sections? No. So they've replaced... So there used to be, in the original Contra, these weird sections where it was like over the shoulder. And it was like these 3D like shooting sections... They've taken those out and they've replaced them with speeder bike levels that are almost like impossible. Mm-hmm. They're even harder than the boss fights because it just gets the madness on screen becomes too much. And you have like just random fireballs like flying. On. Again, like you can get into the zone on this game and feel real good about yourself at times, but other times it's just like impossible and it's just frustrating and you just end up dying a lot and going back and to the same checkpoints over and over. Um, like this is this is the same as the yeah other this is exactly one. the same boss fight yeah um what else can I say all oh, the controls the well, default that's, that's different yeah <laughs> yeah it's... the default controls in this you aim and move with the same analog stick so it's very hard like um just like contra yeah I mean it is and they do get there are other um setups you can set it you can set it up like it goes so it will go OG so you only have eight. Uh, different degrees of firing or you can just set it up so that the analog stick is completely fluid and you can completely control your shots that way Um, this is completely different yeah there's never the second phase of the boss fight yeah um but otherwise it plays like contra and it does get frustrating like sometimes if you're here your character's here and there's an enemy just up and to the right like and there's a platform there you'll fall you're trying to like aim but you're falling off the platform at the same time as you're trying to get the angle of the shot right like the default controls I never felt a thousand percent confident and in control with. Um, they obviously work. You can see the B-roll. You can make it through the game using them. I recommend tweaking it to the way that you like it, though, a little bit. Um, you also have you get a double jump, which wasn't a part of the original Contra. You also get special abilities. You can basically sacrifice your gun to do a crazy powerful attack. And a lot of there's a strategy in that of when you need to do it, when it's best to pull it out. I tend to save it for a boss fight, provided I have the second weapon, which is also a new feature that you can carry two. You can swap with R1 anytime you want. Um, and if you stack the same, so if you have two of the same weapon, it makes that weapon more powerful. So there's a little bit of strategy in that as well. Um, and then if you want to explode your gun, you do that with L2. You basically hold it down and like boost it up, and you can do a crazy super attack. So there are, yeah, there are tweaks to it. I still felt mostly like I was playing the same game, though. It has been 30-some years since I really was good at Contra. So my memory's probably a little fuzzy on it. But um, otherwise, that's pretty much it. Again, the new characters are what make it feel new. And there's a ton. Like There's like eight different characters that you can unlock through the course of the game. And the other thing I should mention, too, you can only unlock the new characters when you play the story mode. If you play the arcade mode, you're not unlocking the new characters, which might make people say, well, then maybe I should play the story mode. I could understand that perspective. Because, again, these new characters are what make the game feel different from the old Contra more than anything else. Because they they have completely different abilities. Like, some of them can fly. Like, the weapons that they get are different. They have different abilities to dash and things like that. Those new characters change the game to me more than anything else that they've done in Contra Operation Galuga. Um, The plot's stupid. It's inane. Eventually, they try to explain how terrorists turn into aliens. Just ignore it. Um, In the story mode, you're going to have to fast forward through a lot of that stuff. Um, But I guess the question now becomes, should you buy it? It's $40. It's available for literally every platform. $40 to me is way too steep. The other thing, too, is this game isn't very long. There's eight stages you can probably finish it in like three hours. So to me, this game should have been like 20, 25 bucks or trying to get 40 out of it. I would not pay that. I would wait till it drops to 20 or 25 bucks. I think that's when you're going to get your money's worth out of this game. Matt, having a look at the B-roll, do you have any questions or comments about it? Nope. No? Looks like more Contra crap. Do you have any interest in Contra at this point in time? Not really. I mean, it was never that compelling a game. Yeah. Really. It's certainly not in the terms of like, I mean, it was a it was one of the top side-scrolling shooter games of you know run and jump games of the time, but mm-hmm. it's like it's not like anybody was like enamored with the setting of Contra. Yeah, or, most people don't even know they go, those guys have names. Right, <laughs> I 
didn't know what their names were until I played this one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I looked it up, and I was like, I, and then I realized I never knew what their names were at all. Also, uh, uh, Contra Four is or Three is better. The the treasure game on Super Nintendo. That's generally what people believe. Yeah. What's the name of that again? Contra Three: The Alien Wars. Alien Wars. Yeah. I remember when I first started at Gamespot, I got in a huge discussion with ryan mcdonald about the best contra and he was a huge fan of alien wars man he would he would die on that hill yeah. to say I mean, the it's least either the first one or that one and really the the third one is has a lot more happening yeah you know it's kind of like the super nintendo's gunstar heroes mm-hmm. yep so anyway does the konami code do anything i didn't try it actually mm-hmm. i will when i go home though i didn't even give it a go maybe it gives you infinite lives that would be nice zed saber asked that too can you use the konami code i didn't try it i should have because the one thing I would say about this that will make the game better is they need a mode where they just give you infinite lives so you can just blast through the damn thing. Like, mm-hmm. a lot of people are just going to want to sit down and just play through the eight stages and be able to take They're on all those bosses. At least give you 30 lives. That's the... For the, yeah, for the arcade mode yeah. they do. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know. I, uh, I had some fun with it. Definitely had a little bit of a nostalgia trip for me at points, but $40 to me is just way too much. I would not pay that much for it. Once it gets down to 20 or 25 if you're a fan of this type of thing, then I would take the plunge. That's the way I would look at it. So... There you go. That's Contra Operation Galuga, and it's available for pretty much every platform under the sun. And with that, it's time for... That's right. It's time for Name That Game Tune, where I play you five auditory samples from a video game, and you try to guess the name of the game before Matt Kyle. It can be music. It can be sound effects. It can be any audio from the game. I basically pour through a bunch of footage from the games, and I try to find iconic sound effects um, to lead you guys along until hopefully somebody guesses the name of the game. A few things before we get going. Um, You can only win once per year. If you've already won this year, don't play. Let somebody else win it. Um, the other thing, too, is that the chat goes on slow mode, which means that you can put in one chat message every 60 seconds. So don't blow your load, so to speak, and just put down a bunch of random game titles hoping you're going to guess it right. Chances are the next sample, you're going to be like, I know that. You're going to try to type it in, and it won't let you, and you will lose. So don't do that. Um, and then the final thing is that um, you must play PC games or know somebody who plays PC games because the winner of this gets a free PC code from either Steam or GOG. So if you don't play PC games or you don't have a friend that you can give the code to, don't play. Don't take the code from somebody who actually wants to play the PC games. Let somebody who wants to play the games win. And that's pretty much it. It's pretty simple. Emperor Dread has already guessed Body Harvest. (laughs) Vincent says the Konami code unlocks a perk that gives you 30 more lives. Mm. There you go. I should have done it. (laughs) I would have probably enjoyed the game more, actually, if I had the 30 lives. Um, okay, so it's time for Name That Game. Bring up the chat here. And Matt, are you ready? Let me get your uh, your headphones, some volume in your headphones there so you can hear the actual samples that I'm about to play. And again, we have five samples. They're obtuse, and they become more obvious as we go. Although I am afraid that people are going to get this one on the first one because I just, I'm not going to explain why. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. But anyway, again, you're trying to guess it before Matt um, to win a free PC game on either Steam or good old games. Are you ready, Matt, for the first sample? Are you all ready? Here we go. Let's play Name That Game for Game Face 380. Here is the first sample. Mm. Matt, his eyes are lighting up. He might know. You guys better hurry. He thinks he knows it. Half-Life 2, no. And we only play it once. So you gotta make sure you're ready. Death Stranding, no. Portal, no. Portal 2, no. Yeah. (laughs) That would count. Yeah. The Division, no. I'm assuming that's Tom Clancy's The Division. Yeah. I I know that sound... I that's can, what this that's what's kind of fun about this I game can, it's can, like you're trying to find yeah. it in your files in your brain right now resistance fall of man nope good guess though borderlands nope any other guesses before we move on to the second one get him in now 
but they may not want to because they're like, oh, here's the second one. I won't be able to put in a chat. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the second one. I'm, I'm happy that we at least made it to the second one on this. Here it comes. Three, two, one. Let's see if we get any guesses from that one. PUBG, no. Slime Rancher, no. Interesting guess, though. Nothing, Matt? No. Splatoon, no. Horizon, no. We just did Horizon. It was like mm -hmm. this two episodes ago we did Horizon Forbidden West. But C-Note, maybe. Maybe you missed that one. Any other guesses? People are being conservative. They don't want to guess because they might be screwed. Cartoon Tom says he knows it. Cartoon Tom, by the way, is a savant at this. It's not RoboCop, is it? Not RoboCop. Nope. Ratchet and Clank. Nope. Okay. Fortnite. Nope. Any more last second guesses before we go to the third one? And I'm really excited we made it to the third one. Okay. Here we go. Here's the third one. Fall Guys, no. Here's the third one. In three, two, one. The Outer Worlds, no. Vincent says, I'm pretty sure every sound effect is in Fortnite these days. <laughs> He's probably yeah. right. So maybe Fortnite was an accurate uh, guess after all. Breath of the Wild, no. Final Fantasy VII, no. Breath of the Wild, no. It's not Tears of the Kingdom? We have a winner. It is Tears of the mm. Kingdom. <laughs> We have a winner. Matt has won. Name that game tune. Congratulations, Matt. Sorry, Stucky. You were too late, bro. You guys were so close with Breath of the Wild. I'm surprised. Well, I guess you couldn't. You can only yeah. put the one chat in. I didn't actually recognize the other two. I just knew the first one. You didn't know where it came from, though. No, I could, I could hear. I knew it was something I played not too long ago. Okay. Here's the fourth one. Mm-hmm. Fucking menu. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the one that everybody heard a million yeah. times. And then here's the fifth one. Yeah, Link. Yep. Well, there you go. Matt beat your asses. <laughs> he got you this time, people. Um, but a good job, guys. Good guesses. Um, I'm just glad we made it to the third one. We haven't really been. I don't think we've done that yet with the audio version, have we? We made it to the third one yet? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think Second so Second one, yeah. Yeah. But not the third. Yeah. So I got you guys to the third one. My goal, obviously, is for you guys to get it on the fifth one. I'll get there eventually someday. I'm starting to get a little bit better at this. Um, Snow, she'll, Matt got it before. We can, we can. were sitting here. We Matt definitely won. Matt doesn't win anything. He wins bragging rights. <laughs> <laughs> but you need him here to compete against. Otherwise, it, it ratchets up the tension. So it makes it more exciting for you guys. Um, you guys say it showed in the chat at the same time. It didn't. We we were sitting here and we watched it. Like, we saw it. So, um, I'm not saying that Stucky didn't guess Tears of the Kingdom on his own. I'm just saying that Matt said it before Stucky's chat ever showed up. Because believe me, I don't want Matt to win. I want you guys to win so we can give away the prizes. Um, but anyway, good job, Stucky. You were very close. You did almost get it. Hopefully you win next time. And thanks for ev to everybody for playing. Um, name that game tune and most importantly a big thanks to soundwizardry.com for sponsoring name that game tune they provide the funds for the free games for you guys when you win so you got a minute here in the chat maybe thanks sound wizard or soundwizardry.com they're the ones who supply the uh the winning games for name that game and look if you have any type of audio work you need done for anything whether it's a game or a film that you're working on Maybe you're working on your own game and you need somebody to do audio for it, or maybe you have the audio, it just needs to be punched up or worked on. They can do anything. In fact, just a week or two ago, they were out on location working with some studio on some game. They worked on two Game of the Year candidates last year. They are really good. And most importantly, and I think if you're if you're a publisher watching this or you're a game developer watching this, think about work, they are good people. Like he has done stuff for us, like that has saved episodes of Game Face and has asked for nothing in return. Just out of the goodness of his heart, he has reached out and helped us. So 
hook it up, man. Soundwizardry.com, good people, good company, talent. Go to soundwizardry.com and hook it up. Hire them. You won't regret it. With that, Matt, that's the end of Game Face episode 380. If you're watching this show on YouTube or listening to it on any of the podcast services, head to patreon.com slash sifted. That's S-I-F-T-D and give us a pledge if you can. For just $4 a month, you get all our content early. In fact, we just launched a brand new show yesterday called Video Game Power Rankings. It's a new monthly show where we basically go and it's it's um, it's a more involved, more thoughtful, most anticipated games where we look at everything. Like, for ex- I'm not, I don't want to spoil what number one was, but the thing with this list is half of it's going to be pretty solid for the most part. The other half of it's going to be fluid. It changes based upon if new trailers for a game launches or if we get new news or if a demo comes out and people hate the demo, then maybe that game gets pushed out of the list. It is this fun, fluid way to look at all the upcoming games in the games industry and help you honestly kind of plot a chart for games that you should be keeping an eye on. I would argue that any game that makes it into video game power rankings is a game that you should be following on Sifted. Go to its game page. There's a little gear next to the title. Click it. In the drop down, click follow. And then anytime a piece of content for that game is curated on Sifted, it will be pinned to the top of your Sift so you can track all your favorite games. So anyway, Again, head to patreon.com slash sifted. Uh, that's where we're really supported pretty much 100%. If you can't give us any money, you can review the show on the podcast services, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. We're on all of them. Review the show there. It's a huge help for us. If you're watching the show on YouTube, you can like the show. You can make sure you subscribe to our channel. There's so many things you can do to help us, even if you don't have any money, and we appreciate all of it. So on behalf of Matt, Thank you very much for opening up your home to us to do this show today. Thanks to all you guys who showed up on our chat. We're here every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash games. And we'll be back here next Tuesday to do it all over again. Have yourselves a great week filled with great games. We'll see you next Tuesday. Game Face is up and out.